Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to day nine now of the hearings here in Epping Forest. It's 10 o'clock, and so today's hearing is now open. Can everybody hear me? Yep, thank you. Okay, so for anyone who hasn't been here before, my name is Louise Phillips, and I'm the inspector appointed to examine the Epping Forest District Local Plan, and the program officer is Louise Sinjin Howe who is your first point of contact for any correspondence with me outside of the formal sessions. Housekeeping, um, if anyone could, with a mobile phone could ensure it's switched off or turned to silent, please. And I will just ask the council again to remind us of the fire procedures and where the bathrooms are. Thank you. Uh, so there's no planned fire drill uh, today. So if the fire alarm goes off, we need to exit. Um, if you exit the way you came in through the door, um, in front of me and down the stairs and then assemble on the green behind. If for any reason that door is blocked, we can use the alternative access exit there down and into the, the car park and then round onto the green. Uh, the toilets are located on the stairwells um, on each floor as, as you came in. Thank you. So a reminder, as usual, about the, um, the filming situation. This meeting is being broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of subsequent repeated viewing and copies would be made available upon request. So by being present here, the recording cameras that you can see will likely capture your image and your image will become part of the broadcast. This could infringe your human and data protection rights, and if you have any concerns about this, you need to speak to the webcasting officer to my left. It's also essential for the purposes of the broadcast that we use the microphones when we're speaking. So if you switch it on when you're speaking and off again, please, when you're not. Um, does anyone else here intend to record, film the hearing? Thank you. Okay, so without further ado, if I could just ask everybody around the table, starting with the council, to introduce themselves, please. Good morning, madam. Uh, my name is Mrs. Humphreys. I'm a solicitor instructed by Epping Forest District Council. Um, and the team today, to my right, we have uh, Ms. Blom Cooper, who you already know, uh, Ms. Karen Moore. And then, as the day progresses, we will also be calling upon uh, Ms. Ione Braddock um, and Mr. James Rogers. Thank you. Good morning, Madam. Uh, David Keane of David Lock Associates here on behalf of the Fairfield Partnership. Good morning, Rich Cook, Essex County Council, Planning. Good morning, Madam. It's uh, Trevor Falkland. I represent Pigeon, Pigeon Investment Management in regard to land at Epping. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. John Warren. I'm chairman of Thaden Boys Action Group, which is a residence group in Thaden Boys. I've lived in the area for nearly 40 years. Um, our mission statement is basically to protect the green belt around our village. We're not a NIMBY organisation, but we do look at planning applications to ensure that they are fully compliant with local and national green belt planning policies. Thank you. It's Elizabeth Byrne. I'm a resident in Thaden Boys. Uh, I've been involved in a number of amenity groups, although I'm not speaking on behalf of them. I am, however, also a parish councillor, and for some of the later sessions, I may be speaking on behalf of the parish council, but I will make it clear if that is the case. Thank you. Good morning, madam. My name's Councillor Peter Gooch. I'm vice chairman of Thaden Boys Parish Council. Uh, well, ma'am, I'm uh, Chris Pond, um, de facto leader of Loughton Town Council, and I shall be joined during the course of the day by Julia Riddle, who is our planning consultant. Morning, I'm Mike Newton from Boyer Planning, representing CEG and Hallam Land Management. Andrew Smith, Vice Chairman of the Epping Society. Morning, Roger Lowry, Epping Society. Uh, Olivier Spencer from Andrew Martin Planning, uh, representing Miller Homes on the east of Harlow site. <coughs> Jeremy Dagley, Head of Conservation for the Conservatives of Epping Forest, City of London. Derwin Liley from Footprint Ecology on behalf of City of London Conservators. Well, thank you very much. As you know, we're here today and tomorrow to talk about Matter 16, the development management policies, um, two of which have been postponed until, until later on in, in May, DM 2 and 22. 
and that's in order to that it can be discussed at the same time as the the habitats regulations assessments but otherwise i intend to just proceed through the agenda and we'll, we'll see where we get to by various break times but we'll take them in the order that they're set out on the agenda i have a list of participants here obviously if you if you can try your best to sort of restrict yourself to the to the policies that you said you wanted to speak about that will help with the uh, with the progress of the agenda but it, it may it may be that that's a that we can be a bit flexible about that. Um, if I could just ask the council, first of all, because the council has produced a schedule of modifications to help us today, which it had attached to its hearing statement, and so everybody will have seen that, but obviously a new one, I think, an updated version has come around this morning, but I don't think there are very many um, additions to that. But if I could just ask the council, first of all, to, to introduce that document and just tell us what it does, please. Okay, thank you, madam. Um, the, the document that's been put round is, um, sets out the uh, schedule that was attached to our matter 16 hearing statement with the proposed amendments that are suggested within the matter hearing statement. Um, those ones are set out in black. Um, in addition, we have added in um, some of the uh, suggested changes that have come through the statements of common ground, some, some of which have been... Um, already discussed at previous hearing sessions and those are set out in green um, <coughs> on the agenda just uh, so that we could put all the amendments for the DM policies in one place and then um, in purple are uh, amendments from one of the, the previous um, hearing statements so if we if something has come through the previous hearing statements we've put them in purple and then there are a few new red ones which are ones that we're going to discuss today. Um, the greyed out bits are because we're not discussing DM2 today and DM22, and it, it just, just to, to stop us getting too confused. Um, so hopefully that is clear, and the idea of having it all set out in one place was to hopefully to help everybody understand what it was we were talking about. Thank you. I, th I, think that's, I think that's helpful. Um, and having had a quick look at it before we came in, I don't think there's very much there that people won't have seen already. Um, however, I've prepared, and I think other people probably have on the basis of the one in the hearing statement, so it might be that there's a discrepancy occasionally in the numbers. If I don't raise anything that you feel should be raised, if you could make sure that you do that, so that will be helpful to everybody. Just Thank to you. clarify, there shouldn't be any discrepancy in the numbers. We haven't changed the numbers. Okay. Where we've added new ones, we've just put a 1A or a whatever, so in, okay. precisely to avoid confusion. Okay, <laughs> super. Thank you. Okay, does anyone have any questions before we just begin on the agenda? Uh, Mr. Smith? Yes, yes. Uh, could you clarify, please, if, if we are, any of us are not called to speak on a particular issue or question or not on any of the issues you have raised to discuss here today, or if some of the issues you don't feel you need more input on today, can you assure us that our statements and our hearing statements, all of us, uh, will still be taken into account in your final report? Yep, the, the hearing statements and, and likewise the representations um, that were received at Regulation 19 and 20, I've read, I've read those some time ago now, but I will take them into account. I will take account of your statements. I think what I've tried to do is refine the issues that I still need more information about. However, with that said, what I'll do is, if, if possible, if I can cover the issues that I want to under each policy on my agenda, if you then, as you're here, if you feel there's something burning that you would like to say that hasn't been raised, provided that there's time for that, then I won't prevent you from doing that. If you want to speak and you haven't had the opportunity, put your board up and you know, we'll do our best to, to hear what you've got to say. You shouldn't leave wishing that you'd said something. Okay, thank you. Right, so we'll turn to policy DM1, first of all, which is habitat protection and improving biodiversity. Now, my first question on, on there, and, and we're, we're looking at my MIQs today, I haven't done really a separate agenda, which was the accounts that have been taken of the Lee Valley Biodiversity Action Plan during the preparation of the plan. Um, the council has confirmed that accounts has been taken of that, and I, I did have a I did have a question concerning this, and I would like the council perhaps to just explain that it has had regard to the action plan 2019 to 29. I think is the is the relevant plan, and if you could just talk about that a little bit. But I think I see in the new schedule that a further amendment is proposed concerning this matter. So if I just ask the council to comment on what it intends to do about this first of all, and then. Perhaps um, Mr. Dagley, Mr. Liley, if you've got any outstanding comments, you could raise them. 
Thank okay, uh, so the proposed amendment uh, 1A uh, refers uh, to this. Um, we're proposing to, to add an amendment to, to deal with this point. Uh, can I just start off by saying that we are proposing to delete all references to key evidence throughout uh, the, the local plan submission version uh, from the final version of the plan uh, to ensure that it doesn't become dated. So there are likely to be other instances of the plan where we will need to make consequential amendments uh, to the text, uh, which we will um, hope to pick up in the proposed main modifications. Specifically in relation to this policy, an amendment uh, number 1A, which you can see in front of you, is proposed at the end of paragraph 4.11 of the uh, plan uh, in the supporting text to clarify the position that the most up-to-date versions of documents will apply such as the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority uh, Biodiversity Action Plan and indeed the Essex um, Biodiversity Action Plan. Um, so we are suggesting um, an amendment to add, we'll take account of the most up-to-date versions of those documents um, into the text as set out there. And, and the reason for deleting the key evidence is, I think, the point that has effectively been raised by the Conservatives is that evidence gets out of date, and in order to ensure that the plan doesn't get out of date, we're not referring to out-of-date documents. We're, we're suggesting that we change it. Thank you. If we just ask, first of all, about the... If anyone has any co uh, comments on the principle of deleting the references to the key evidence and um, adding in appropriate sort of references where appropriate. Anyone have any comments about that in principle or any concerns about that in principle? Yeah. Sprom Cooper, so if, if, if you're proposing to delete that generally, are all of the consequential changes that you feel are required to make sure there is appropriate referencing addressed in this document? I don't think they probably are. We, I think we would need to go, if the principle's accepted, we would no, need to go through and make sure that they are all addressed. Okay. I, I don't see any particular problems with, with, with that approach. All, all I would say, and I suppose it's a question that I, is, is just to make sure that um, it's not just a reference that's required. If there's anything sort of more than a passing reference that's required, that that's addressed. So if there are key things that are coming out of those documents that you know maybe maybe time limited but appropriate, then they need to be reflected as well. But I, I, I don't see any problems with just deleting the list of key evidence as long as it's appropriately referenced within the text and nothing is lost. Okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you. So if we... Mr Smith. I'm not sure this is the right point to raise it, but on, on the policy DM1, uh, which is this, what this is referring to, um, perversely, I'm, I'm slightly concerned about the reference to all development should seek to do certain things. It just seems to me totally impractical. We're, go we're going to come on to that. That's, that's sort of the second question about um, oh, biodiversity sorry. gain. No, no, that's okay. Um, as I say, perhaps it would be best if I raise all my questions first and then if there's anything outstanding, we can go back to it. So if I could just ask perhaps um, the Conservators, first of all, do you, do you have, are you, are you satisfied that the Council's proposed amendment 1A would address the concerns you raised in your statement? Um, the concerns, because we didn't raise specific concerns about Lee Valley, um, you know, and 1A, oh, the, um, sorry, the supporting text. Um, I'm trying to think where we... I think you'd, you'd raised concerns in your representations initially yeah, in red about red um, the key evidence paragraph not making reference to the Lee Valley Biodiversity Action Plan. And so the council does now pr propose to refer to the 
um, action plan as part of the supporting text rather than in the list of key evidence. And it's confirmed in its statement that it has taken it into account. Sorry, Inspector. That's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm asking the wrong people. I'm asking the wrong people. It was the Lee Valley Regional yeah. Park Authority. There's any, anyone here today? No? Okay. Okay. Apologies. <laughs> Looking to you for completely inappropriate reasons. Okay. Well, it appears to me, as they're not here, that that would address their concerns. So we'll make that amendment. Thank you. Okay, so if we move on to the question two, which concerned part A of the policy, and my question was, is it justified to require all development to seek to deliver net biodiversity gain? Would this be possible for applications concerning minor alterations to existing buildings or advertisements, for example? So, as I understand it, the council is proposing modification, which is still amendment number one in the new schedule, to add in, where possible, all development should seek to deliver net biodiversity gain, etc. And they say the, the reason for that amendment is to apply a proportionate approach reflecting paragraph 109 of the NPPF. Um, okay, let's take comments on that. We start with Mr. Spencer. Thank you, Mark. Um, my client was originally concerned that, that policy DM1 was too restrictive in requiring uh, net biodiversity gain on all development. So with that in mind, we do welcome the council's proposed modification to part A, um, which recognises that where possible, all development should seek to deliver a net gain. However, I, d I do still think there's an inconsistency um, at part H of the policy, um, because part H still insists that development proposals must demonstrate a net gain in ecological units. Um, so to be consistent with the council's proposed mod, um, we would suggest that part H should also be amended to read where possible development proposals should seek to demonstrate a net gain in ecological units. Um, and I think that would make part, parts H and A consistent with one another um, and also um, provide the flexibility my client's looking for. Um, just, just looking at part a, H, I think we had assumed that the, the where appropriate at the end of the first uh, sentence had dealt with that matter, but uh, I do take the point that Mr Spencer has made, and I think we could add development proposals must demonstrate where possible a net gain in ecological units, okay. um, and that may make us consistent with what we now propose for part A. Thank you. Lowry. Concern, ma'am, with the proposed amendment contains three levels of subjunctive or conditionalness. Where possible, should seek, where appropriate. We think that's a bit soft. We'd like to have seen something a bit firmer that developers would know they had to stick to. Thank you. Mr Lowry, what would you say in response to the other points that have been raised around the table in support of the change, which is that you know, so it, it might not be possible in all cases for development to stick to that? I think, I think that's the intention. I think the, the exception, the exception ma might be for small developments, such as done by um, a private builder where they're looking at um, 15, 20 houses, say. But I think big ones should be required to uh, support the, the policy. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We'll, we'll come back to the council on that. Mr Smith. Same point, really. We... We, we, we obviously support the objective of improving biodiversity and, and the objective of habitat protection, um, uh, which we think all larger developers should have to do. We just don't think it's going to work for small developments. And by putting in the sort of exceptions which the council proposes, 
we can see that over time the whole thing would be watered down and in practice nothing would be required. It's been written on the basis of a, of a mandatory rule with large developments in mind and now it's pointed out that won't work for small developments. The proposals seem to abandon the entire policy in the way that Roger has just mentioned. <coughs> Mr. Spencer. Ma'am, um, just to clarify on my uh, client's position, it's not their intention to try and avoid the policy in any way. They, they understand that their development has to or, or should demonstrate a net biodiversity gain. But the reality is their site includes some very major pieces of infrastructure, um, M11 Junction 7A, the new link road to Gildan Way, and also the potential relocation of the hospital. So depending on how that calculation is carried out, if those infrastructure proposals are included in the wider mix, um, meeting a, an overall net biodiversity gain might be challenging. Um, that isn't to say that my client won't do it on their um, housing-led, uh, residential-led part of the site, but I do think the flexibility in the wording is important where there's major infrastructure on sites too, as well as on the, uh, the very small sites. Can you suggest any wording that might address Mr. Smith and Mr. Lowry's concerns, but would still satisfy your concerns? My view is that um, I think it's uh, the, the council's proposed amendment is suitable, and um, Ms. Blom Cooper's comments uh, about a further amendment to, to Part H would be suitable, and then it would be for the development management team to to judge every proposal on its merits. Really, I think. If we add a lot more wording, the, the policy could get a bit um, a bit messy. Slightly. Thank you. I think the um, the council should be applauded for including the policy, which is um, as written. It's in line with emerging um, best practice, and um, biodiversity net gain is is getting more and more momentum. And I. I would worry about amendments to the wording at point H because H is actually talking about where there is impact. So that is different to uh, the, the proposed amendment where possible all developments should seek to deliver net gain. H is specifically saying where there is an impact, the, um, it will be necessary to use the metric. So I think um, it's important to, to retain that. And. Um, I think the issue is the very small things like, as has, has been raised, hoardings, advertisements, mm. extensions, those kind of things. And, and even with those, net gain is possible. For example, very small um, artificial habitats, bird boxes, bug habitats, some planting, hedgerow work. So net gain is, is something that more and more should be incorporated widely and doesn't need to have to be particularly onerous. I think I, one, ex one way to deal with this might be just to specify the, the areas where net gain might be so out of proportion, for example, advertisements, if there really is no, no option. Mr. Dagley, Mr. Smith, and we'll ask the council. Thank you, Madam. Just to, to add, I think I'm slightly troubled by one of the comments um, in relation to what is sounds like quite a large development. Um, in, the, in the biodiversity net gain principles, um, there are various different organisations that have come up with principles. I'm quoting from the um, CIEM, the, uh, my institute, the Ecology and uh, Environmental Management, um, that if you can't manage net gain on your site, particularly a large site, you should be looking to make sure that net gain is provided off-site or uh, through potential offsets. Um, I, I don't think it's something to be avoided. I think, um, as um, my colleague has just said, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. And then if there are reasons uh, that it's not proportionate, they can be discussed. It would be better that way around, I think. 
Um, and of course, it's relying on the planners um, to have sufficient specialists or uh, specialist um, consultancy available to them to be able to make the judgments on, on whether the net gain is true. You have to measure what you you're might be losing as well as what you might be gaining. Thank you, Madam. Smith. No, I wouldn't want it to be thought the Epping Society thinks that all large developers are out to ruin the countryside or wreck biodiversity. We, we don't believe that at all. Uh, we just think that larger sites have more money at hand and greater financial and human resources available to deliver these sorts of things. Uh, we're not against the idea of offset and, and um, the biodiversity and protection being provided on other sites if that's what has to happen. Uh, we recognise that large developments inevitably cause a large impact. <coughs> But we don't think that smaller developers can do some of these things and that small developments will become uneconomic if everything has to have statements submitted by, no doubt, outside consultants at, no doubt, the cost of hundreds or thousands of pounds in each case. It would make work very difficult. We think that the wording the council has come up with is not helpful. It leaves too much judgment to the Epping Forest Council and there is no trust locally in Epping Forest Council. We do not think that they... Is this the wording of the amendment? That you're yeah, the, the amendment. We, 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 we don't think that's acceptable. We do, there is not trust locally in the council to apply these rules. There have been too many cases when they have breached their own policy, for example, by permitting development in the green belt. So this wording would basically mean there is no policy on this subject. Okay. And, and that's not acceptable. Can I can also say that I mean, the council has seen our hearing statement and no doubt other people's hearing statements for some weeks. I'm surprised they haven't been able to come forward before now with a better modification. I don't think it's really practical for us to sit here and suggest modifications on the fly. I think the council has got to come back again with a, an improved modification. I think that's what we should ask them to do. If we come back to the council now. Um, I think the, the modification amendment number one, which is I think the one we're discussing, was included in our Matter 16 statement, which, as, as uh, Mr Smith has pointed out, has been available for some time. I think our view is that uh, we should not make a blanket exception for small developments, as Dr Lilly has quite um, helpfully um, told us, even small developments can provide net uh, gain um, and may, may be able to deliver net improvements, which would otherwise be lost. So uh, we, we wouldn't want to be watering down. OK, th thank you. I, I think we'll, we'll leave the matter there, but I'll say for my position, I've heard what, I've heard what everybody has said. I'm, I think we, we're, I'm, I'm quite satisfied that 1A, Amendment number 1A, should be made. I'll give some thought to whether Amendment 1 and the proposed amendment to Part H should be made um, on the basis of the discussion that I've heard. I'll also give some consideration as to whether an amendment to the supporting text could be more appropriate to perhaps explain some of the concerns that have been raised by both sides um, of the table in relation to not accepting large developments, you know, utterly where possible, um, and also in relation to some of the difficulties perhaps faced by the smaller developments. So I'll, um, I'll reserve my position on that, I think, and think about what you've, the, the valid points that have been raised by, by both sides. Okay, so thank you for that. But we'll, we'll move on now leaving DM2 aside. We'll move on now to DM3, which is landscape character, ancient landscapes and geodiversity. Madam, may, may I just ask yep. one, one thing? Sorry, just for clarification, sorry, madam. Um, uh, because you've combined in one of your questions, I see you put it under DM2, which is um, helpful from our point of view. Um, this is the one about combining um, the uh, policy DM, t sorry, well, to, to combine Epping Forest, holistic approach to Epping Forest or the Epping Forest SAC. Um, I just wanted to say in our Regulation 20 response, we'd indicated under DM1 uh, in response to your question three uh, or uh, under DM2 that we'd uh, we want uh, the holistic approach to Epping Forest, and I think we are happy with that to be considered under DM2 if, that's, if, if the discussion is deferred to, to May rather than through DM1. Um, but we would like to discuss it, the holistic approach of non-SAC sections, and we're assuming we can do that under DM2. 
Yes, I, I think I think if you've if you've got if it would have an an effect on policy DM one, I think that's fine. But I think the council's position, particularly, is that it would it would like to sort of discuss all of those matters relating to the SAC when it has its specialists here and when we've all had time. But if, if that would result in a an amendment to a different policy, I don't think we'll preclude that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, the relevant amendment that's, that's here for discussion is on page six of the council schedule, amendment number four. So my question initially was, is the wording of the policy itself sufficiently detailed to be effective in protecting the landscape from significant harm? Should it, for example, incorporate some of the requirements of the supporting text? And is it clear what will be expected of developments on the edge of settlements? Um, the council has noted in its um, statement that there are provisions in other policies that would also deal with this matter to some extent, but it does propose an amendment number four um, to make specific reference to settlement edge locations and to reference the role of the landscape sensitivity studies and the historic environment characterization study, which you can see written down there. Um, my question, perhaps first of all, before we take any other concerns in relation to the policy, is should reference also be made to the landscape character assessment, which is listed in the key evidence paragraph, perhaps under part B of your proposed amendment? So that's my question to the council. If we could just discuss that amendment, if the council could explain its amendment proposed and then we'll take any other points in relation to that or anything else around the table. Uh, thank you, Madam. Um, yes, as set out in paragraph 25 of our hearing statement, in order to improve the clarity and effectiveness of the policy, the Council do propose an amendment and that is amendment number four, which was contained in the schedule attached to our matter 16 statement to policy DM3. Uh, to specifically refer to settlement edges and the need to assess development proposals uh, with reference to relevant available evidence. Um, so we are proposing in addition to uh, part A, little one, which is set out there to include the words in, in particular in settlement edge locations, and a new policy uh, B, uh, which was, is to uh, set, sets out the impact of proposed development and its design to be assessed with reference to landscape sensitivity studies. And I think we meant by that the, the landscape uh, study that you've referred to, but didn't want to make it specific to that one if there were, were further work done uh, during the plan period, and also the historic environment characterization study or subsequent studies. So it's deliberately left without being making specific uh, reference in order to, to ensure that um, if there's an update or a later study undertaken, that we can take account of that. Thank you. Mr. Pond. Uh, I wanted to refer to your question, Madam, uh, which is, should parts of the explanatory notes be incorporated into the policy in particular? Uh, my council strongly believes that the last paragraph uh, of the explanatory note immediately before the box DM3 in the, uh, in the, in, in the uh, plan should be incorporated into the document, and that is in particular in relation to sites within built-up areas. And that is, has particular reference to Loughton, because when the northeast part of Loughton was developed by the London County Council in 1947, 48, 49, uh, particular attention was given to maint uh, maintenance of the landscape character within the new urban area. That applies, of course, to Jessel Green, but it also uh, has reference to uh, field boundaries, trees, etc., some of which are no longer with us. Uh, so I, I think, Madam, my council wants to say we, we do agree with you, and we do think that that uh, last paragraph 
uh, ought to be incorporated in the policy. Thank you. Anybody else? Come back to the council, perhaps if you could respond to Mr. Pond's concerns. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think we feel that with the proposed amendment that we're suggesting and the references already set out in the supporting text that the matter of um, dealing with the policy applying equally to sites within built-up areas and those of the, on the edge of settlements is covered. Um, I refer you particularly to the last sentence of uh, paragraph 4.31 of the local plan submission version. Mr. Pond, does that give you any comfort? It does, it does state in the supporting text directly above it so that it applies to built-up areas. Uh, it, it does, madam, but we feel it would have greater validity on the face of the plan rather than in the explanatory paragraph. Thank you. One last question to the council on, on that point then. If you, if you agree that it's necessary to um, make specific reference in the policy to settlement edges, why, why is it not necessary to make reference to built up areas? Um, Madam, I think if you wanted to make that a suggested modification, we wouldn't be averse to it. We don't think it's necessary because we, we think it's, it's set out there and, and it, it's specifically the edge of settlements is, is key to this because obviously the edge of settlements will change as, as growth is pursued um, and uh, uh, through the lifetime of the plan and therefore the settlement edge study may need to, to be updated and so we, we think that's more sensitive than the, within the existing built up area. Thank you. Thank you. Anything different on policy DM3? Okay, thank you. So we'll move on now to policy DM4, Green Belt. Council, just confirm, first of all, you're not proposing any modifications to this policy, is that right, or am I...? Uh, we no, are yes. proposing a modification to the supporting text... Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah. Uh, ..to DM4, which comes from the Essex County Council and EFDC Statement of Common Ground, and is specifically the summary update, EB1508, paragraph 14, page 7, which I think we discussed uh, to some extent last, last week. Um, and just to be clear... Um, the original amendment proposed in our hearing statement, number five, is superseded by this proposal. It was originally going to put it in the supporting text of policy D2, but following conversations with the County Council, we're now proposing uh, to put it in, uh, after, in the supporting text for DM4 after paragraph 4.35. So effectively, the amendment five would be deleted and we... Uh, from our proposals to be superseded by 5A. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll come on to, we'll come on to the, the school issue. Um, I'll 
I'll just, I'll start by asking my questions. As I say, if we get to the end and I haven't covered anything that you want to say, then, then do that. I mean, my, my first question relates to, which was number seven on my MIQs, which says, the policy essentially repeats policy in the MPPF, but does not duplicate it entirely. Is it intended to do anything different? If not, would it avoid duplication or confusion to state that development will protect the purposes of the Green Belt in the manner required by national policy. Now, the Council, I think, is confirmed in its statement that policy DM4 does not intend to do anything different from national policy, and so it is consistent and cannot affect the soundness of the plan, but given the extent of the Green Belt in the district, the Council would like to retain a policy in the plan. Is that broadly accurate? It is, Madam. Thank you. So, in that sense... I do have a, a few questions in relation to how the policy differs. Um, and again, I'll just say I don't have any problem in principle with keeping this uh, a, poli a policy in. Um, part, uh, if I, I'll point you to the parts which differ, and I just wonder whether there's any reason why they differ. And then I guess the broad question is, if it's not supposed to do anything different, would it be easier to replicate it? more fully. Um, so in the MP, part A3, I'm looking at now. Um, the NPPF, the purpose is to assist in safeguarding the countryside from encroachment. Is there any reason why the wording is different? No. No, there isn't. Well, I'll ask all the questions first, then we can perhaps discuss at the end. Part C5. You have said, you've used the term limited infilling in smaller settlements as opposed to villages, as used in the MPPF. Is it necessary, is there, is there a reason for that? And if there is, is it necessary to somewhere define smaller settlements. Sorry, madam, I just want to look at um, H3 because obviously it relates to H3 as well, policy H3, and see what we've said there because I think one of the key parts is that we've tried not to repeat uh, things which are in different policies in the plan. Um, Madam, I see that we do use the same term in policy H3. Rather than suggest something on, on, on the fly, I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask if we can take it away and have a look at that. I, I'll take your point. Okay, part C6. So 
So the NPPF refers to limited infilling or the partial or complete redevelopment of previously developed sites, whether redundant or in continuing use, excluding temporary buildings. Now that part about redundant or in continuing use, excluding temporary buildings is omitted in DM4. Is there any reason why it would be omitted? I think we were just trying to paraphrase the policy rather than just simply repeat it. Okay. But I don't think we have any particular view about um, amending it to be consistent. Okay. And finally, um, this is a bit slightly different, part D refers to other potentially appropriate forms of development. We are always advised to use the word, to use not inappropriate rather than appropriate. So I would recommend that you change that. Are there any other differences or potential conflicts with national policy that anyone wanted to raise? Mr Lowry. If I could just return to the second point about the villages and small settlements. Uh, is this perhaps because the District Council are wary of mentioning any specific tier in their settlement hierarchy that they used in the site selection process? They don't want to limit themselves to a particular type of settlement through that policy. So they wanted to say smaller settlements. That's just a perhaps a helpful suggestion. I think we were trying to use a term which covered both um, smaller settlements, um, villages and hamlets. So, so it's, sorry, Mr. Dagley. Um, just a, a point, Madam, uh, it's probably more related to the SAC issues in May, but um, in relation to Hamlets and that point under um, DM4, um, uh, uh, C5, uh, the infilling on um, smaller settlements, one of the settlements that we're most concerned about is a Hamlet at High Beach, and the issue for us there, it's, it's a mainly an SAC issue, but there the Greenbelt washes over High Beach, but there, are, there have been... Um, exceptions already made through planning where High Beach has developed further than certainly the Conservatives would be happy with given the closeness to the SAC which is just 400 metres away um, and there is an issue remaining there with uh, potential land uh, being developed so from, a, from our point of view that wording is probably quite important. Thank you. Just in relation to that specific point, before I come back to what I was going to say, is, is it the case, I mean, obviously we need, we'll talk about it in May, but, it, but is it the case that sort of specific issues like that would be intended to be captured by other policies rather than the need to adapt your Greenbelt policy to limit limited infilling in particular villages? I think I'd like to go away and think about that rather okay. than just uh, say something now. Okay. If you take the point that Mr. Dagley's raised, Go going back to the sort of more general point, then it's, it seems it seems that the um, the reference to smaller settlements perhaps warrants a little bit more consideration for a bit of thought about. But in relation to the other issues that I've raised, I think your position was that there was no reason for it to be different. You just didn't want to just bluntly copy out the whole thing. It may just be, in a sense, it might just be me being pernickety. Does anyone have any views about it? I, I, I guess my feeling is if you intend to just replicate it, it would be easier to replicate it and then there can be no, there can be no discussion later on that you might have been intending to do something different. I know it may, may seem a bit silly to do that, but if you are intending to replicate it, I think I'd advise you to just replicate it. Any, any, anyone depart from that view? No? Okay. Mr Pond. Uh, Madam, it's just a question of definitions. <clears throat> uh, we have in Loughton um, a small hamlet called Debden Green, 
which is, I think, entirely surrounded by Greenbelt. But it can sometimes be regarded as part of the major, larger settlement of Loughton. I think the hierarchy, as you, you've just said, needs to be set out, including uh, hamlets uh, within larger uh, settlements, including Loughton and Waltham Abbey, which are physically both very large parishes. Thank you. Okay, well, Ms. Bum Cooper, when you consider what the smaller settlements that that part five is intended to apply to, if you just give that careful consideration, I think perhaps, a, perhaps if it's a definition somewhere in the supporting text of where that's intended to apply would be useful. Yes, madam. Thank you. Um, sticking with Greenbelt, but moving on to a, a different matter now. Um, this, is, this is a point perhaps raised by Thaden Boys Parish Council and also the Action Group, who we helpfully have with us. Um, they've suggested it would be helpful if the supporting text explained the factors which might be taken into account when deciding whether a development proposal would be disproportionate or materially larger, and also that consideration of openness has a visual dimension. Um, I think the Action Group is also concerned that locally specific Greenbelt policies which are included in the adopted local plan have been omitted from this one. So before I come to, that's the, that's the question essentially for discussion. Perhaps if I could ask the relevant people at the back there to explain their concerns and then we'll ask the, the council for their position. Thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, if the parish council uh, is concerned that there's a, there's a general lack of uh, guidance, the, the MPPF obviously is a framework and at a high level. And we, we feel that if there's no um, actual guidance at all levels of the planning process, then um, the policy is left to a certain amount of um, uh, uh, subjectiveness in terms of what is materially larger, etc. what is the definition of openness. Uh, we sort of feel that um, this could lead to certain inconsistencies in terms of decisions being made because of individual um, um, interpretations of what that policy actually uh, means. Um, so we wondered actually whether it would be best um, perhaps to have a supplementary planning document in this which would actually go into and actually uh, provide definition uh, of that. We are aware that uh, other local authorities use this method uh, we are aware, sort of locally, of um, Guildford and Windsor and Eton have gone down this route, and we think perhaps that that would be the best way to um, to meet this requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Warren, Dr. Warren, sorry. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I fully support that view. Um, <clears throat> in our um, hearing statement to you, I've repeated uh, what. Uh, your good self, the inspector, said that it duplicates it, essentially repeats policy in the MPPF but does not duplicate it entirely. The MPPF, as we all know, is a framework. Um, para 1 and 2 of the MPPF 2012, which I understand this local plan is being judged on, says it provides a framework within which local people and their accountable councils can produce their own distinctive local and neighbourhood plans which reflect the needs and priorities of their communities. I don't believe that policy DM4 does that. It merely points to the MPPF. The MPPF then points to the importance of local plans. I'm not sure if this is sort of catch-22 or something from Franz Kafka. Um, I make an apology my tra I'm not a medical doctor. My training many, many, 40, 50 years ago is as a scientist. As a scientist, I look for criteria. I look for specificity. Um, we're 92% green belt. Therefore, the importance of policies that impact on our green belt go without saying. Um, I can't make my mind up whether EFDC have gone for the broad brush framework approach for flexibility, for expediency, for them good sales, but organisations like Thaden Boys Action Group are local stakeholders, and there are many local stakeholders, town and parish councils situated within the Green Belt, and I just think we need greater specificity than what's put forward here in DM4, which I 
have to say I regard a little bit of a cop-out. Um, this could well lead to individual planning officers making their own policy on the hoof, and I think there could be variations, discrepancies between different planning officers because there's no specific policies. When the MPPF 2012 came out, I think it's 27th of March, <coughs> EFDC's council, Mark Beard, went through all of the policies, including Greenbelt policies, and I have it here, which was presented to local plan cabinet meeting and onward to cabinet. I think with the exception of one of the Greenbelt policies, I'll stand corrected on this, I think it was GB8A, they were all um, given the go-ahead to be used in by councillors at committee in the planning uh, process, planning appraisal process. And I know that where certain uh, <coughs> refusals by FDC have gone to appeal, the planning inspector has cited and relied on our existing local plan policies. Um, and I think that's an important point here. Um, I have referred to the uh, reference for this Mark Beard's document. Um, I can give it to you again if you wish. And it's LPC 011 2012 stroke 13. And it was reported to the initially local plan cabinet committee on 25th of March 2013. And the FDC will, if you so wish, be able to provide you with a copy of that. Um, in terms of local uh, needs on, on policies, I'll be frank, I didn't have sufficient time in the limited consultation process. I know it was only for SVLP and it only referred to legality and soundness to look at all of them, but extension of residential curtilage is something that comes up again and again locally where someone has agricultural land, gradually includes it into their residential curtilage, which then becomes blurred, and then under GPDO, subject to sort of single story height restrictions and closeness to the boundary, you could cover 50% of that land without planning permission. So things like residential curtilage, I think, are, um, is something that's important. GB7A, conspicuous development, um, I've heard councillors and sometimes officers say, well, if it can't be seen, it doesn't matter, whereas I take the view that if it can't be seen but it's on the green belt, it's encroachment. GB15A, replacement dwellings, DB4, design in the green belt. Um, anyway, I've put this to you for your uh, consideration, Inspector, and all the details are in our hearing statement. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Could, could I ask the council perhaps to come back on that? I think in the, Mr. Uh, Dr. Warren has raised the issue, obviously, that in the, in the context of green belts being a significant issue for the district, whether you feel that it would be helpful, if not to sort of define um, what these are by very fixed limits, for example, because I've seen that done elsewhere. It's sort of a, a size or a proportion, whether it's possible to um, give any more indication about the types of issues that would be harmful. Um, first, if I may, Madam, just uh, refer back to the Cabinet report that um, has been uh, referred to. Obviously, that document was produced uh, for members uh, relating to existing policies and their compliance with the 2012 MPPF for decision-making purposes uh, prior to the uh, new local plan. And what we're doing here is to set new local plan policy, so I don't think that's... Um, particularly relevant to this, this conversation. In terms of setting more locally specific criteria, um, the council have uh, considered that carefully, but do consider that each planning application, particularly in a district as diverse as this, uh, to be determined on its own merits um, and in accordance with local plan policy, and that should be the starting point. We don't think uh, locally specific criteria are appropriate in the plan uh, because such formulaic responses as you have outlined don't take account of the specific local circumstances sufficiently and those need to be evaluated uh, on their own merits depending on the context and design of particular proposals and their impact on the green belt and its openness and we don't think a set of rules is not appropriate however we do think it might be a suitable 
consideration for neighbourhood plans, which by their nature can deal with more uh, particular local circumstances um, and may be appropriate to set those types of criteria relating to uh, particular areas of, of the district. Uh, we do think if we, in due course, we wanted to produce SPD, that the policy will give us a sufficient hook with which to do so. Is it the Council's view that any of the deep more detail in the policies that Ms. Uh, Dr. Warren has been referring to, uh, have there been unintended consequences of those? I mean, is, is there a reason that the Council wants to dispense with the more detailed criteria that it had before? I, mean, I, th I think what Dr. Warren's point was in the Cabinet report is that it was considered that, those, uh, that, that the criteria within those policies was, was still appropriate. And so the question is, what, what, why isn't it appropriate now? <coughs> Why is it necessary to move on from that? I think, I think it comes back to an encouragement by central government to not have un, unnecessary and, and, and additional policies in the plan. And this is a high level uh, strategic document and a more locally specific criteria can be set out in neighborhood plans. And uh, I mean, indeed, the Dayton boys are preparing a neighborhood plan. I would suggest that that was an appropriate place. If I could just hear first from Mr. Cook, and then we'll come back to Spurn. Thank you. Yes, having uh, listened to this debate with some interest, my inclination is that the, the uh, preference of the County Council is likely to be um, to support the view of Epping Forest District Council on this matter. Um, I think in summary, I don't think the County Council would find trying to add additional prescription guidance in the form of policy to support a standard greenbelt policy would be particularly helpful. For what it's worth, I have uh, experience of working for a district council in an extremely similar situation to Epping Forest in the past, right on the, the very borders of London in, in Hertfordshire, whereby the same situation applied with the entire, entirety of the district covered by Greenbelt, except for those urban areas that were specifically excluded. So the question of Greenbelt <laughs> development came up again and again, and the council found itself facing exactly the same kind of issues as we're discussing right here and now. Uh, in response to that question, I do recall that authority trying to introduce some additional uh, policy criteria, such as something around the way of guidance for, you know, whether or not, for example, a 25% or a 30% or a 35% uh, allowance might be considered appropriate. And in doing so, I think council found itself tied up in knots. It wasn't <laughs> particularly helpful in summary because, for example, you know, a certain percentage, be that 30 or 40% of a very large building is a very large extension in terms of uh, for those existing sites that are developed within the green belt. And for example, if you try to do that with very small buildings, then that may be overly restrictive. So trying to take a, an additional sort of policy criterion approach, I don't think would be uh, beneficial. But of course, as uh, Ms. Blom Cooper has said, if the council is inclined and finds it helpful subsequently to introduce such things as SPD around this issue, then it remains within the gift of the council to do so. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Spurn. Yes, I think one of the things that was to be made clear, and I'm Sorry. certainly aware of this, and, and I Speaking do know... Speaking to your microphone. Sorry. I do know of a, a local authority that I don't think has gone to examination yet, where they had put together some 15 pages of green belt policy and put in precisely the kind of criteria that gentleman's referring to. That's not what we're referring to. We're well aware that you don't sit there and say 30% or 40%. What we were saying was the assessment criteria that would come forward so that when you're looking at something, you can take into account what you would deem to be materially larger, which factors would be taken into account. So it's made clear to all parties, made accessible from residents all the way through to parish town councils and obviously to developers, so that 
what we'd had previously was one of the assessment criteria was that they would take into account volume. Now, that doesn't come through in this at all. It is an important one because we've had many um, planning inspectors' decisions where volume is taken into consideration. That is the spatial element of development. It can be basements as well. The planning inspectors have allowed that increases in volume include that. When we talk about openness in the green belt, we're talking about the spatial or physical element of the development and the visual element, and that comes through in judicial reviews. That's a phrase that's been used. So what we're really looking for is something that I'm explaining today, which I'm sure the planning inspector is familiar with, but quite a lot of those who are using this as a policy. I know it's a higher level, but of course the, the council has gone not just for strategic local plan, it's the whole local plan. We've no supplementary planning documents, I think, suggested will come on to design later as well. It's giving that um, guidance to officers, um, it's giving the guidance to developers, it's giving the guidance to all interested parties as to what criteria the council takes into account. Not that it specifies 20 or 30 per cent, wouldn't attempt to do that, and also just bear in mind with a supplementary planning document, as indeed with the plan itself, one would always be mindful not to be prescriptive. So bearing in mind that we have other local authorities, and we did look some time ago at Guildford, and of course we've realised that uh, Windsor and Maidenhead are going to have a supplementary planning document. I'm sure the advice to them, if it were to be given, is not to be too prescriptive. But bear in mind the number of local authorities who do have supplementary planning documents and are mindful of that. It is giving um, a little bit more detail on what the criteria are. I think you will find that if you were to ask someone to sit down, even a member of the council, so I'll include the district councillors, and say, write me, what do you think is included in openness? Um, not so much what, what is, what's taken into account with disproportionates. For instance, planning inspectors will sometimes say, it's an obvious one, if you go for a 110% increase in um, the physical form, that's likely to be disproportionate, we can all recognise that. But they also recognise on occasions if you want to increase the height of a building, it might be both architecturally disproportionate. So there's a lot of different things that come into play, and it's that understanding <coughs> that sometimes becomes quite subjective. And we have, as I think was mentioned, we've known, um, bearing in mind that members are decision makers, we've known them say at um, committee, things like, if you can't see it, it's not harmful. We know that planning inspector would never take that view, but it can be quite a persuasive argument um, to some of the councillors who think that that is, is one element and it's quite difficult to balance it. So I think this is where it gets a little bit subjective. Um, there's a lot to be taken into account. Greenbelt policy, working it through is quite difficult. When one starts an analysis, you always start with whether it's inappropriate development under the relevant paragraphs and then work through to see whether it has an impact on the openness and on the character of the landscape setting. Planning inspector at appeal is quite consistent. It isn't always, I've got to say, followed through um, at the district level. And I think more guidance. That's why we said a supplementary planning document, because it will not have quite the same um, precedence as the local plan. It's not, not going to take over from the NPPF, but it would provide background. And with 92% in the green belt, I think it's also worth bearing in mind, so quite a lot comes through in this plan, that invariably the council is really looking at the larger strategic allocated sites. But the applications that come in day by day, every day, are the smaller sites. And these are the ones that we as parish town councils are so often asked to look at. And we're finding ourselves, I know Epping Town Council the same, when we're now putting in returns, I'm sure the council would like us to be brief, so I will be brief. Uh, when we're putting in returns, we're having to sort of start by explaining the context, explaining the policy, and hoping that we're putting in together those criteria, which we're reasonably familiar with. I think, to be fair, I think you'll find some of the amenity groups are as well. It's almost as if we've got to go back over it each time, whereas when the council did have further guidance, for instance, what was mentioned about residential curtilages, insofar as there was a policy on residential curtilage, it was saying, if you extend that residential curtilage, if you buy a field, you turn it into residential curtilage, you're changing the use. It's giving an indication to applicants. That's really what we were looking for. Okay. So thank you very okay. much. It's the accessibility okay. for those of us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Yes, I think Epping Society would endorse almost all of that and also endorse the point John Warren made about um, the NPPF 2012 calling for a degree of localism. Uh, it's disappointing that EFDC are rejecting the opportunity to have some localism. I think also would draw attention to the point about extending the residential curtilage. There's a case going on in Epping at the moment where this has happened over the years and 
the planning authority seems uninterested in um, looking into the background of that. And so now the entire site, even though part of it's in Greenbelt, is regarded as part of the garden for the house and therefore available as part of the background for a, a large new planning application. I would also refer to the, the question I mentioned earlier on in a different context of trust. Uh, over the years, EFDC have granted development applications within the green belt, contrary to their policy at the time, um, and didn't seem to bat an eyelid when they did so. Uh, and therefore, we're very, very concerned that if there isn't this additional context provided, um, they will continue doing that. Uh, and we're already feeling a bit sore that we're about to lose, we're sure, a very large amount of green belt, and we don't want it to be nibbled at further in the future. Uh, the Epping Society reviews over 300 planning applications each year in Epping and the surrounding area, and so often we are putting in the sort of responses, uh, we're, we're drawing attention to developments because they're in the green belt, uh, and yet in some cases we find that consultation between the applicant and officers has, has indicated a green light in the past, and we find that very disappointing. Um, uh, and yet we find we have to spend a lot of time doing this. We're happy to do it because we see it as our responsibility to the local people. We don't think anyone else is doing that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Let's come back to the council then. Um, two questions. Firstly, um, is, is the poli in light of what you've heard, is it sufficiently clear um, how a decision maker should react in a case relating to the sort of materially larger openness or disproportionate um, type issues? How do you give guidance to officers and ensure consistency? So that's the first question. And the second question is, does this policy deal with curtilage extensions, which have been raised a couple of times as local issues? Uh, we would contend that the policy is uh, sufficiently clear and that the uh, supporting text, particularly paragraphs 4.34 and 4.35, provide sufficient guidance. Uh, to um, decision makers when looking at such um, applications. Um, it's very difficult, as, as we've already discussed, to be very specific about uh, criteria in a district which is as diverse as, as this one and has so much green belt. Um, the, we'll come on to talk about the design policies, but we feel that that and the need to obviously in green belt to demonstrate very special circumstances is sufficient. Thank you. And on the, on, the, sorry, on the matter of curtilages, did you want to comment on that? I don't think I've got anything much more to add on, on the, uh, uh, other than you know, looking at each application on its merits and uh, considering it in the context in which it, it finds. We have um, de defined uh, or limited infilling um, in paragraph 4.34. Does the council have any intention to produce an SPD? Is it something that's on your agenda? Or how, how would you make the decision as to whether that was necessary? Uh, there's been no decision about making any uh, supplementary planning documents or guidance uh, following uh, the adoption of the local plan, but it's obviously it's something that the council can always uh, come back to, um, provided that we have sufficient... Uh, hooks in the plan, as it were, policies in the plan, which mean that we can produce guidance. I think we have taken the view until now that uh, there are a number of neighbourhood plans in production and that that may be a more appropriate place for such uh, guidance. Thank you. I know, Ms. Byrne, you've got your... Is it very quick? Because I want to... I've, I've heard what you've had to say. I don't want you to repeat it. Um, I would actually disagree that it's not the role of a neighbourhood plan um, to set down any criteria specifically in policy on green belt because what would happen then, you'd end up with exactly what you didn't want, with neighbourhood plans starting to say, we'll set out um, the criteria under which it's I mean, I've never heard it said that neighbourhood plans would enter into that level. Um, it's certainly never been put to me and I've never seen it that you could put into a neighbourhood plan what you wish to say um, for additional criteria in... in Greenbelt policy. I, I think that's not the right level. I think it's for the council to consider a supplementary planning document, which then is taken into account by those on neighbourhood plans. Um, but I've certainly never heard it said that you can go that far okay. in, in policy. I think that's probably not correct. Okay, thank I'm you. Sorry. I'm keen to move on now. So Mr Pond, Mr Lowry, and then we're going to move on to schools. But be, be brief, please, and don't repeat what's already been said. Extremely brief, madam. Though we didn't specifically comment on this policy, 
I think in general terms we would agree with um, Thaden Boys and Epping and a commitment to produce a supplementary planning document would be very welcome. Thank you. Salari. What he said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lowry. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll move on now to the specific question that we had about schools, and there is a, a proposed amendment. So uh, my understanding was that there, was no, there are no specific proposals before us at the moment to expand any schools, um, but there is a, a proposed amendment now to the supporting text, which you can all read for yourselves, number 5A. On page seven of the schedule, um, which is intended to address the issue of school development does come forward. Now, I'll turn to perhaps the County Council first to explain whether this would address its concerns, but I just wanted to raise the points that we heard in a previous hearing quite recently um, that there has been instances where school land has itself been released for alternative uses and then lo and behold there's a need for more school land and I don't think it would be the, in, the intention of this policy to um, provide exceptions for that kind of approach and so I just wonder whether it's necessary to reflect that within the amendment in any way. Um, Mr Cook, could, would, you, would you like to start, first of all, to say whether this addresses your concern? And if you could address the point that was raised at that previous hearing, I think that would be helpful. OK, thank you. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'll take the County Council's representations and statement on this matter as read, rather than try to repeat that. Um, but just to give you a very brief summary, the County Council was concerned that sufficient flexibility needs to be provided for the expansion or other alteration of schools, school sites located within the green belt. And, and as the County Council has shown, there's a sig significant number of uh, green belt schools located within Epping Forest District, whereby those schools and the entirety of those are washed over by the green belt. And I think the number is uh, well into the 20s. I think it's having like about 24, 25 schools within the green belt. On that basis alone, uh, it was clear to the county council that over the course of the local plan period, and the fact that we can't always foresee all different potential changes of circumstances, and allowing for the fact that the district uh, has to accommodate quite a su su sizable area of growth over its local plan period, then it's pretty safe to say that some of those schools are likely to expand. So the County Council has been discussing this matter at some length with Epping Forest District Council. Um, there were a number of ways in which this could have been tackled. What we've arrived at in the end is a form of wording to support the actual policy without making changes to the policy itself. And the County Council would be supportive and satisfied with this wording which we find to be helpful in this matter and the consideration of potential planning applications for applications of this nature over the course of the uh, local plan period. So yes, County Council is, is uh, content with this uh, wording. I'll leave the other parts that you mentioned uh, for now. Mr Pond. Uh, Madam, I couldn't have put it better than you did a few moments ago about the sequential uh, at the sequential uh, cyclical nature of school provision where the land of a school is sold off and then a shortage of places is uh, declared and the green belt has to be um, raided. In Loughton uh, we have had what was regarded because of falling roles in the 80s six schools, huge land release and I worked out some 700 dwellings built on them. That then led in the 90s to a demand to release Greenbelt land uh, for a new secondary school. And uh, as Mr Cook has said, this is a cycle which is very difficult to, uh, to, to, to deal with. We would, however, um, 
not disagree with the proposed wording, except that in the future, should a school authorised under exceptional circumstances in the Greenbelt be declared redundant, then any it should not be regarded as a brownfield site, but should revert to Greenbelt and be subject to all the constraints of the MPPF for appropriateness in the Greenbelt. Cook. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we're starting to get into the, the subject matter of the, of the point that you made before about that, so that's, that's fine, I'm happy to do that. And in response to the point that's just been made, I think we need to be a bit more clear about the status of uh, potential school sites that may have closed. Yes, they would, they, as things stand, they remain within the Greenbelt, and that would be the case. They would still be covered by Greenbelt protection, but I think it would be important to note that the status would be as previously developed land. So again, um, drawing upon the example that I mentioned earlier, some other, some other district councils in similar circumstances to Epping Forest have taken particular approaches towards previously developed sites within the Greenbelt, and there are other districts that have very large schools um, within, within these types of areas. And in some cases, they've taken a proactive approach towards that, whereby those have had development envelopes identified. Those, the district council has asked those, the, the owners, the occupiers of those sites to produce long-term potential development plans, envisaging the, ki the kind of growth that they anticipate may be required over the local plan period. That is one potential more proactive, more plan-led approach that can be taken in this area. But I think it's important to note that yes, these sites remain within the green belt as things stand, but they would represent previously developed land. Mr. Smith. I'd just like to endorse the point that Mr. Pond made. We've, uh, we have the same situation in Epping. Uh, all the schools in Epping seem to be located on the very edge of the town, largely on Greenbelt land. And we've seen examples in other districts around the country where schools remote from a town have, have become redundant. Uh, and the local planning officer, together with developers, are very keen to build houses all over it on the basis of its previous developed land. So I think the restriction on the use of that land in the future is a pretty key issue. And if I could say so, I think AFDC and the County Council would get a lot more buy-in from the residents if they felt there was a bit more understanding of our concerns on this issue. It seems that on all these points, the councils want to retain the maximum flexibility, which is always to, to find ways of encroaching on the green belt. If there was a bit more openness and honesty about how this was going to be done in the future, the public could once and for all reconcile themselves to the loss of green belt and know they had security for the future. The public don't feel that. They feel, feel it's a, a ratchet always in one direction. Mr Lowry. Tinsley point, ma'am. Um, council, your proposed policy wording E, do you want to insert the word district in the third line? I think it is, isn't it, in 5A? One in front of me says green belt in Epping Forest. But, but we're talking about 5A rather oh. than 5, which I think 5A has been said to supersede 5. It does say, it does say, you, sorry, apologies. That's okay. Um, I have, there is another potential typo, which I'll, but I'll raise in a minute. But um, ju just coming back to the, 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 the point of principle, can the, can the council give me some comfort in light of what's been heard about how the plan would deal with a school, uh, an existing school site in the green belt or not in the green belt that becomes redundant, houses get built upon it, and then under the terms of this paragraph, a need comes up for school expansion in the future when actually you've used school land for a different use. I think that's the concern that's being raised. You've got school land. What is being done to protect that school land so that we don't need more green belt land in the future? 
That's the question. How does the plan do that? And does this sort of make it easier, if you like, to have situations that Mr. Um, Pond and Mr. Smith have described? Because I think we, we would want to avoid that. As Mr. Cook has explained, uh, where we've got to with the County Council has been the subject of very long and lengthy discussions. Originally, the County Council asked us to take all the school sites out of the Green Belt, and it's precisely for that reason that we um, haven't been prepared to take sites out of school. Well, we are very concerned to um, ensure that uh, it, there is an expansion into uh, housing development by stealth onto, the, onto these sites. Um, and that's the reason for uh, the supporting text to give the county councils some comfort when, if they need to expand and extend schools to meet the growth in the district. Obviously, with the growth being proposed, we don't anticipate um, there's this, those sites to become uh, not, not in need for school purposes. Should they do so, we would expect, like all sites coming forward in the, in the green belt, to be subject to you know, uh, discussions, development proposals, and so on. But we are constrained, as you know, by the wording in national policy and the definition of previously developed land, and there's little that we as a council can do about that. Mr. Cook, do you do you have any suggestion that uh, obviously it, so 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 the situation is actually the council hadn't proposed to do anything to change the, the definition of inappropriate development. This represents almost a compromise um, position, but I think there is still an outstanding concern that this could make it easier to get development on greenbelt land when actually what should have happened first was the protection of existing school land. Is there is there any way that that could be reflected so that that were also given? appropriate weight. I just I wanted to respond really in, in a in a similar vein to uh, the Epping Forest District Council because I would contend that it's clear really from the representations that the County Council submitted, from the statement that the County Council submitted, and from the form of the wording of the proposed change to the supporting text, that this change is not about allowing for redevelopment of those sites on mass when, if or when those sites become redundant. Um, this wording is all about providing for education related growth and needs over the course of time. We, we, we do know, as I've mentioned, that some of these sites are likely to need to expand over the course of time. And one of the considerations that needs to be made here is that that needs to be done in a sustainable way. So Epping Forest is quite a large rural district. It covers a, a substantial geographical area. For that reason, the district is divided into what are called education planning groups. So for example, you have some of those that would cover the Epping area, the Harlow type area, the area to the east where Ongar is located, uh, and the County Council needs to look at the provision of these schools in a local sustainable way and that may mean that one of those schools may need to expand in a particular location to accommodate that local growth rather than ferrying pupils off halfway across the district. So it, it, it's, it's those kinds of questions. I would contend that the wording as proposed does not open the door for the floodgates for the wholesale redevelopment of these sites. 
having listened to the concerns of the local organisations, I do understand those concerns by virtue of what's said to have happened in the past, and I'm unable to comment on those circumstances because I, I haven't been involved in any of those cases or been aware of any particular sites that have been closed and redeveloped. But I would contend that this wording does not uh, raise those types of concerns specifically, it's quite clear that it refers to education-related developments. And I think we also need to bear in mind there that there's a whole series of considerations around what's likely to happen in education in the future. We are aware, and we've stated in our comments, about the government's preference for parental choice. Uh, there's also the consideration around some schools becoming more popular or less popular as a result of um, their Ofsted ratings and those kinds of things. We also need to bear in mind, look at where in one of the county council's other hats, the health and wellbeing agenda. And that may mean uh, development in, on school sites in the future for things like indoor sports facilities to make sure that we're trying to raise healthy pupils. So, and there's also the, the dual use, the community use of school facilities as well, which can represent a highly sustainable form of uh, provision for other kinds of users in the community. So I think we need to be aware of that broader context within which education is likely to sit and change within the future, and that there's actually a lot of different opportunities around potential development uh, of the school sites in the future for the purposes that we've outlined that we are trying to provide for. Just, just so I can be clear, Mr Cook, in light of what you've just said, does, does that suggest that there is, um, that there is in fact a, a greater risk that school sites might be used for other purposes in the future? Well, we don't envisage being used for other purposes that are wholly unrelated to their primary educational use. There may be ancillary uses uh, in the cases that I've mentioned, whereby I think sport, recreation, leisure type uses may come forward as they have done in the past. And there is that um, dual or community use agenda as well to think of. But I would argue that those uses are kind of ancillary and supportive and related to the primary use as an education facility, rather than talking about other kinds of development that is entirely relate unrelated to the substantive education use. And from a fact, practical and functional point of view, there are good reasons why that remains, uh, needs to remain the case. Because, for example, if other uses were permitted on school sites, there may well be security issues. We have to be very, very careful of ensuring the security of existing pupils. So the County Council is, is clearly trying to envisage development that is supportive of and related to the education use, rather than anything that is entirely unconnected with that. Thank you. Can I give the council the, la the last say on that? So is, is it the council's position? I, I understand this is a, a compromise um, position. Is, having heard everybody's concerns about, around the table, is it, is it the council's position that this amendment is required for soundness or, or not? Uh, we, well, we didn't originally put it in. Um, it, it, as, as you rightly indicated, it is as a result of conversations with the county council because they wanted some comfort that, that if the, a school needed to expand on an existing site, it would be treated as, a, as potentially a very, very special circumstance which could be given material weight. Um, in answer to your question, no, we don't uh, think it's necessary. Um, but but, but uh, was... was okay intended to give the count, county council comfort. Thank you.
Okay, that, that's everything that I wanted to say on the green belt. Is there anything else anyone wanted to say about green belt before we move on? My, my, what I'd quite like to do is deal with policy DM5 and then take a break if people are happy with that. I think we've set up around the table for everybody that wanted to get to the end of DM5. So we'll move on to policy <coughs> DM5, which is green and blue infrastructure and the design of development. Okay, and so the relevant amendment here for when we get to it is on page seven of the council's schedule of this morning. Um, number six. Okay, so the question on my agenda was a simple one. Should part A1 require designs to have regard to improving the connectivity of habitats? And that was in response to reps by the Environment Agency and proposed amendment six would do that. Does anyone have any concerns about proposed amendment six? Good. Okay. So moving on to a couple of other issues that have come out of the statements. It's been raised whether part B1, and this is the Fairfield partnership, I understand, right? So, so you, you can explain it and you can explain your concern. Is part B1 unduly restrictive in its requirements for tree protection? Mr. Keane, would you like to explain your concern about B1? Yes, it's a, it's a simple um, point, madam, um, and I think part of it is about layering of policy. Um, in uh, policy DM1F, there's a, a clear recognition that the benefits of development must be demonstrated um, before um, uh, any tree loss, and we entirely endorse that proposal. You've got a very sensible policy in um, DM5.1, um, it is just the way, uh, our concern is the way that policy um, B, uh, B2, um, B1 rather, could be in, interpreted. It, it's just a rather strange wording. It, it almost implies that you have to demonstrate how everything is being retained and protected, whereas the previous policy, uh, policy in A1 um, except obviously that there's a, a balance and, and you would have to bring forward proposals showing how you achieve that balance in any substantial uh, master planning exercise. It's quite a simple point, but I just think um, policy B1 is capable of sort of over rigorous interpretation, if I put it that way, and I can't see really the necessity for it. It's quite simple. Plum Cooper. Um, thank you, Madam. I think uh, we see the two policies as being distinct um, and operating separately uh, to each other. So policy DM1 Part F, which Mr Keynes referred to, deals with the matter of whether the loss or retention of features themselves is appropriate, whereas Part B of policy DM5 Little 1 um, deals with um, ensuring that the delivery of development uh, where trees and landscape features or habitats are to be retained on site, they're protected in a condition that enables their continued life and value, and, and that, that simply represents good practice. So we don't uh, consider it is unduly restrictive um, in the requirements for tree pr protection. And we're not uh, proposing any amendment to policy DM5B little one. Are you, are you concerned that this would require every single tree? that's on site as existing would be protected? Cause yes, I just think it's, it, it's capable of that, that interpretation. Perhaps there's some form of wording we could look at just to um, address that point. Do you accept that point or, or um, not? Yeah, well, subject to what's being suggested, uh, uh, without un understanding what the, the proposed amendment may be, it's difficult to comment. Sorry, so the... Uh, well, if, if Mr. Keane wants to suggest a proposed amendment, we'll, we'll look at it, but without seeing um, the wording of it, I don't really want to co comment no, no. further. 
but, it, but it's not the intention that that should require every single tree on every single development site to be protected. No, I think it, what it's requiring is the evidence to support uh, that, which would need to be assessed by specialists as to whether or not uh, those trees should or could be retained. Skeen, did you want to make any further comments or any suggested? No, I've, I've said what I need to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Newton. Yes, thank you. Just briefly, it's my interpretation of this that, that part B of the policy is not about the principle of tree retention because that's dealt with elsewhere. It's about implementing that principle successfully where it applies. It's a simple distinction, I think. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Mr. Dagley. Thank you, Madam. Yes, I just wanted to support the Council on their wording and also agree with Mr. Newton's point. Um, I think it's quite clear it's about implementation in DM5B and that uh, best practice, which will be changing over time, um, so in that sense that the uh, policy doesn't become outdated, is really important. And we've seen with the MPPF changes just recently how important that is with veteran trees and ancient trees being recognised for uh, their irreplaceability and the importance of protecting them. And I think it's absolutely key that best practice is used. I was at a site on Friday uh, where best practice had been used and it made a huge difference to the landscape around the housing. And I think it's really critical that, um, that it is addressed and it's addressed in a structured way, which this, this I think, is lay laying out. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Mr Pond? I uh, just wanted to agree with the Council's proposed wording for B1. Uh, I don't know whether you know, Madam, but uh, I believe there are more veteran and ancient trees in the parish of Loughton than there are in the, uh, the Republic of France. Uh, Dr Dagley will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Epping Forest, not the SAC, but Epping Forest, the local government area, is renowned for the number and quality of its trees and I think due protection has to be given to them, and B1 does. Thank you. Okay, me, Ms, me, uh, Dr. Warren. Yes, if I can just agree with um, <coughs> Dr. Dagley, um, <coughs> I agree with um, <coughs> B1. I must declare an interest. My wife is a local tree warden for Thaden Boys, which is just a voluntary um, occup well, occupation. Um, veteran trees are very important. It's getting more and more difficult to get TPOs put on trees in Epping Forest District because of um, reduction in the resources available, tree officers to do the work. Now, whether this all stems from central government cutbacks to local authorities, I don't know. But more often than not, you find... A veteran tree in a, in a back garden, say in Thaden Boys, that could have been going back to a, an ancient hedgeland, um, the house changes hands. If you don't get wind of what's likely to happen, the new occupants cut the thing down and it's gone and there's nothing you can do about it, possibly because they're looking for a summer house or something in the back garden. So I'm more than, <coughs> pardon me, more than happy with um, B1 and I see no reason to change it, and I'm very pleased that veteran trees are included. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mo moving on now to a concern expressed in the, fi the final question in relation to this policy. Um, the Epping Society had expressed concerns that the policy might prevent development required for identified traffic mitigation schemes. I think you've mentioned particularly the junction of Ivy Chimneys Road with Faden Road. I think the concern was around... Um, that, it, that it couldn't retain and enhance existing green infrastructure. Is that right, Mr Smith? Are you able to explain your concerns a bit further? Yes, I suppose it's partly a linguistic thing. That to say you're going to retain and enhance, and yet you know you need to chop trees down to, enhance, to, to make new roads, is, is, is a conflict in, just in its own terms. Um, of course we want to protect trees um, and green space, but we're wary of having policies which 
clearly have to be overturned because it makes the whole thing then subjective. Just, just as, a, as a general point, which maybe I could ask the council to comment on, because it's coming up quite a lot about this sort of whole where possible, you know, to what extent can the, the DM policies allow for every every single scenario? I mean, we, we obviously have the sort of the, the where material considerations indicate otherwise, and I, I, there's, a, there's a potential argument that there'll always be an exception, and I don't know how far the council can be ex expected to address every exception through its DM policies. I mean, you're, you're quite right that if you, you need to cut down some trees, it's not going to comply with this policy, and I wonder to what extent that, that matters or whether that would be a... Um, a material consideration, for example, in that particular case, and we can't expect to deal with every single circumstance. So I'll ask the council to address your concerns about that, but that's perhaps a, ge a general question about how people feel about that around the table, because I think that, that applies to lots of different policies and lots of people's concerns that we've heard. Mr Lowry. Yes, ma'am. It is just that there are a class of traffic mitigations proposed in the IDP that will need take of areas with trees in not just the one, there's probably five or six across this area, never mind the rest of the district. Thank you. So, so in relation to what I've said, what would, be, what would be your proposed solution to that? I mean, do, do you think this policy requires amendment or should there be some recognition that there will be particular classes of development that can't comply? Or do you think it will just be fairly obvious in that case that there are other policies which support that traffic and that traffic improvements and there will occasionally be conflicts? I think it's very difficult because the two issues are both important to the local community and for the environment and for the forest and so on. But I think it would be interesting to see if the council have a proposed priority in mind. Is it road mitigations or is it trees? And they perhaps need to have a policy or a thought on that before we move forward with a conflict built into the various pol policies. And which way would you fall? I'm just trying to be very clear about what your concern is. Is your concern that we couldn't get through the necessary mitigation, or are you concerned that the necessary mitigation will require tree loss and therefore we shouldn't have the mitigation? You need to be clear about our your position. Our, our preference probably is that we would prefer priority given to traffic mitigation, sadly, right. because the lack of that will, it is and will choke up the district. Thank you. Ms Smith. Yeah, I think we must must come to that conclusion. On the other hand, the question that I've mentioned several times, I've used the word trust, which I'm sorry if that's an aggressive word, but it basically if there's more openness with the public on what's required, rather than having a policy say we'll protect all trees but we're also going to have roads, and then leave it as a, a subjective decision to be taken late, later, where I'm afraid the public generally don't think the planning officers and the FTC have done terribly well, and we don't understand the transparency of what's been done, uh, you know, building on the green belt, contrary to policy, which has happened in the past, people don't understand that. Far better to have a much more open statement of what's required. And, and the point made earlier in a different context about um, additional planning policies, supplementary development policies, um, that also helps the people to understand, the public to understand what's going on. And it's likely in the longer term to allow this plan to go ahead with less aggravation from the public. Mr. Dagley. Thank you, Madam. Um, yes, I'm not sure I completely understand the points being made um, as to why this would conflict. I think in um, policy DM1D, which reflects the uh, mitigation hierarchy uh, on page um, 80 of the plan, I mean, that's the very clear way of setting about any um, assessment of um, a, a, a development. And if you start with mitigation hierarchy, which starts with a void, um, then, in a way, that should be clear and transparent on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, as provided that's open to the public, I can't see the problem with that particularly. For DM5, um, it's about the green and blue infrastructure. In, in other words, it's trying to look at um, uh, maintaining them. I think the, the point I would make here, which is a point we made in our Regulation 20 response, is that 
one of the gaps might be, which might go to one of the points just being made about what the public might feel, is that I think the, 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 there needs to be, as we've said, a green infrastructure plan, a more proactive, mapped-based plan, showing where connect connectivity needs to be made, indicating links between sites, so that some feel for uh, what the council regards as sites which really are important to connect up. For example, obviously with us, it's the um, Conservatives are keen to see our Epping Long Green and our Green Lanes and our Lower Forest connected up and not isolated by development and by roads. So I think that's the kind of thing that could be shown on a map and would help answer that. And I think, as I said earlier, the policy DM5B is about implementation on sites, which I think we've, we've covered. And I don't see there's a... a, a, a a direct problem for, for road building, certainly. I've never seen that, certainly, in the past. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam. Mr Lowry and Mr Smith, have you said what you were going to say? Yep, OK, thank you. Ms Blom Cooper. Um, well, as, as you can see, uh, it's a difficult balance in this district. Um, we have sought to uh, minimise the traffic mitigation measures that will be required in order to support the growth in the district, and those are set out in the infrastructure delivery plan. We don't think that the policy would prevent uh, the necessary traffic mitigation schemes being brought forward. The policy, as, as Mr. Dagley has said, is intended to provide for green and blue infrastructure and connect this to existing networks as set out in part B, little three, uh, which, which states that the proposed green and blue, blue, blue infrastructure so the nature and scale of the development, its setting, context and intended use are all part of the judgment to be made in applying the policy and therefore we don't think it would be used to prevent necessary development um, and would enable development such as traffic mitigation schemes. Thank you. Could you, could you comment on the points made by Mr Dagley about the absence of a, a GI mapped plan? Um, well, he, well, he's correct. We haven't got one. Um, I, I, I think we have tried to set out in the infrastructure delivery plan um, relation to particular settlements the, the, the measures that will be brought forward through that um, and we certainly would like to see improved connectivity particularly between the forest and Lee Valley Regional Park and um, other settlements. So I don't think we're against that, we just haven't done it. Bush Dagley. Sorry, Madam. Just, just one point. I, I mean, I welcome that um, indication. I think the, the key about that is, is to get that into uh, policy that there will be that proactive approach. And I think it's the, the, the issue there really is that it, um, if the council's not careful, it will be um, uh, a, not project level, application by application led rather than st strategically led, which I think it does need to be, particularly with the importance of Epping Forest, which obviously we'll come back to at the May hearings. I think it's, it's such an important site. The, as mentioned earlier, actually, by um, Councillor pa uh, Pond, the, the, um, the forest itself sits within an ancient landscape, which is full of ancient trees, and it's a really special landscape. Um, and I think that does need a proactive approach. Um, the forest itself uh, benefits from that, and indeed it, it would be diminished if we lost those interconnecting trees, as we know. Uh, we know that populations of fauna rely on that interconnectivity. Uh, there's good evidence from studies in Sweden as well as elsewhere in Europe. So I think um, it's something more proactive is required, and it's, so it's not just an um, application by applica application led. Um, thank you. What, what would you suggest, Dr. Tackley? What, 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 what amendment are you seeking to achieve that? Um, uh, the main amendment would be that uh, a map does show a green infrastructure plan, a proactive plan with areas of um, priority for, for connectivity. Um, we've touched on it earlier as well, um, and we'll come back to it, no doubt, in May about the Asang's strategy and the need to um, uh, point that out. And I was going to make, uh, we have suggested our Reg 20 response, an amendment to uh, DM5-3, uh, DM5-A3, uh, which I also see relates quite well to DM6, um, which we haven't made comments on. Um, and if I just, um, sorry, just need to find my, just find the wording, sorry, uh, madam. Okay. Um, for example, to DM53, um, one suggestion that we made in our Reg 20 response was that it, to add on to where the DM3 ends or space, um, we add the words including specific provision for European 
site mitigation in accordance with the strategic approach outlined at policy DM2, and obviously we, we've got to revisit DM2. The, the point I'm making here that the strategic approach does apply to the SAC, but it applies to more than that. It applies to the important sites all around, uh, including the SSSI of Epping Forest, but also the, the non-SAC bits. I know we'll revisit that um, in May, as we talked about earlier at this hearing. Um, but I think that change or some reflection of a, a, um, a strategic approach and a mapped approach would be the changes I would be looking for in, in the policy. Um, if I could just c come back, um, I, I think the comments I made earlier related to the map, I, the Council will be producing a wider green and blue infrastructure strategy, and that will link with the strategic approach being taken into the provision of SANGs uh, for the special area of conservation and other networks within and indeed beyond the district. If it's an intention to do so, would it help to address Mr Dagley's concerns if, it, if the in intention could be stated? in the plan. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Okay, and final point, Mr. Pond, please. Uh, Madam, I was uh, going to express my uh, complete agreement with Dr. Dagley and his last remarks and also refer back to his uh, comments on matter one, which that some of the mitigations um, to traffic proposed cannot be achieved without considerable damage to the SAC uh, and to the tree cover there in itself. But I was going to ask you, Madam, um, assuming that you'll be moving on from this issue soon, um, as to why uh, in paragraph 437 and the list of key evidence the community tree strategies, which have been, I think been completed for seven parishes, including Loughton, are not in the key evidence. A great deal of time and effort was put into them by the parish councils, the parish councillors and EFDC officers. And they are a very cogent uh, part, in particular, in um, demonstrating how the connectivity, which you, Madam, put into your comments, your questions, uh, could be achieved and to ignore all that work done over six or seven years and not to regard it as part of the local plan evidence base seems to me totally misguided. Um, in response to Councillor Pond's comments, I can assure him that those were taken into account and particularly at, at the draft local plan stage. Is it, is it the case that when you make your consequential amendments to address the um, key evidence and how that should appear in the text, that, that, that appropriate reference could be made to those documents? Yes, and yes, indeed. Uh, but I think we can also make sure that they feed into the, the, infrastructure st uh, the green and blue infrastructure strategy. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Has everyone said everything they want to say in relation to DM5? Yes. Oh, um, one thing that Ms. we've Brown. said at a parish level in discussion with many groups is the importance to us, of course, of green and blue infrastructure. We had been hoping very much to see a workshop on green infrastructure. I believe there was at one point an initiative um, to engage, um, in fact, in that instance, unusually, um, those from immunity groups, tree wardens and so forth. And Dr Jeremy Dagley did attend one meeting that was... Um, set up to that. All we'd like to say is that, yes, we, everything's been said, we're very supportive of that all the way through. We're glad to hear the Council's going to do some more work on that, and we do hope that at parish level, again, we can be engaged um, in any workshops that take place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll have a break now. If we say until quarter, quarter past 12, when we'll then come back and, uh, and carry on with the agenda and see how far we get by lunchtime as close as one o'clock. Mr Cook, did you want to query something? I do apologise. I didn't quite get the opportunity to say it before, but I just noted with interest your question to Epping Forest Council as to whether or not they considered the amendment to the wording for policy DM4 in respect of Greenbelt Schools necessary for soundness. In respect of that matter, County Council has referred in paragraph 11 of its statement 
to the Chelmsford City Council recent local plan examination whereby this matter also came up. And it's that things have moved on now, that examination process has now concluded in terms of its hearings and uh, the modifications are, are being uh, finalised. And just to mention the fact that uh, a modification to a very similar effect of this in a very, very similar form of wording is going forward in those modifications. So by deduction in that case, it would appear that the inspector did consider those necessary for soundness. So I would just request that reference is made to that examination process in respect to this matter. I'm sorry about having to bring no, that up afterwards, fine. but no, I didn't quite helpful. get the chance before. No, that's helpful. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr Cook. OK, we'll, we'll leave it there now, and we'll come back at quarter past 12 and then carry on until roughly 1 o'clock before breaking for lunch. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Will. We'll make a start. First of all, a couple of new faces around the table. Can we just have some introductions for anyone new that's appeared? You're from the council, first of all, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, Mr. James Rogers is uh, with us now. Thank you. Anybody else? We have everyone, Mr. Berendt? Mark Berendt from the Home Builders Federation. Thank you. Everybody else was here already, were they? Okay, excellent. Right, well, we'll move on to policy DM6, which is designated and undesignated open spaces. Um, 
My, my outstanding questions really relate to question 10 and question 14 on my um, MIQs, with the others really being largely addressed, although others can feel free to, to raise any points that they wish to in relation to those. Um, so my question 10 was, having regard to paragraph 73 of the MPPF, has a robust assessment of the need for open space, sports and recreational facilities being carried out? Is it justified to base the requirements upon nationally adopted standards rather than local ones? And should the appropriate standards be set out in policy? I think it might be helpful if I could just ask the, the council to give us a sort of brief summary of its position in relation to that question. Thank you, Madam. Um, it is quite a, a lengthy response, but I think it's quite important to set out the council's approach to this. Um, the assessment of open space provision does take into account the growth proposed by the plan as well as the needs of the existing population. As we explained in paragraph 24 of the Matter 5 hearing statement, statement, that's the Council's hearing statement, the site selection process measured the adequacy of remaining open space within each settlement through a cumulative achievability assessment. This assessed the site allocations proposed in each settlement in combination and looked at the impact of the proposed development on open space provision within the settlement. <coughs> Paragraph 4.87 of the site selection methodology, that's EB 805AK, and section 3 of Appendix B 1.6.2, that's EB 805L, explains the purpose of the cumulative achievability assessment and the methodology adopted to measure the adequacy of remaining open space within each settlement, which draws on the findings of both the open space strategy, EB 703, and the infrastructure delivery plan, EB 1101A stroke B. As part of the site selection process, we undertook a cumulative open space assessment. That's criterion 3.1. The methodology at Appendix B 1.6.2, that's EB 805L, makes clear that additional population growth was taken into account. And I'll draw your attention specifically to pages B 824 and 825. The results of that cumulative achievability assessment are included in the pro formas which are set out in Appendix B 1.6.4, which is EB 805N for each of the settlements in the district. Those sites proposed for allocation have this information completed. Uh, for example, page B 937 uh, sets that out for Jessel Green. Paragraph 4.44 of the local plan, the supporting text, sets out that the council considers that open space provision is critical to the physical and mental well-being of communities. The open space strategy, EB 703, provides an up-to-date and robust assessment of current supply and demand for open space within the district, including areas which have an existing surplus or deficit, and those are set out in sections 7 to 12 of the report. Taking account of existing provision and shortfalls, the strategy sets out the requirement for the creation of new open space, as well as for improvements to existing open space, to serve the needs of new development and the existing community. The findings of the open space strategy, the built facilities strategy, which is EB713, and the playing pitch strategy, EB715, or 714, sorry, are reflected in the infrastructure delivery plan. Um, and figure 54 on page 111 of the Infrastructure Delivery Plan Part A report, that's EB 1101A, identifies the additional open space required for each settlement by the end of the plan period. And pages 112 and 113 list the specific interventions which are required to ensure there is adequate open space for new and existing communities in the district. And those interventions are also set out in uh, the schedule to the infrastructure delivery plan. 
Uh, the open space strategy uh, states that the future needs of the strategic allocations around Harlow should be considered further uh, for the purposes of the schedule. The newly arising need, which has been calculated using the standards included in the open space strategy, have been included and, as we discussed last week, will be subject to further consideration as part of the strategic master planning. I set out in policy DM6, where appropriate <coughs> proposals will be required to provide open space or links to open space in accordance with both the infrastructure delivery plan and the strategy. Uh, so the assessment of open space does take account of the proximity of open space to particular communities as well. Um, and table 3.2 of the open space strategy um, identifies the guideline for open space provision per 1,000 population as well as an appropriate walking distance for residents to access the particular typology of open space. And those, this methodology has informed the um, measures um, identified within the strategy and infrastructure delivery plan in order to meet the needs of new and existing communities. Um, so we have considered the proximity and accessibility of open space uh, throughout the plan making process. As you heard last week, the, there is a further <coughs> infrastructure delivery plan being produced for the Harlow and Gilston Garden Town, and that will also include open space provision in respect to the sites in Epping Forest District. And that IDP will reflect also the same need that's been identified in our own infrastructure delivery plan. As we discussed last week as well, the Garden Town will, IDP will also reflect the likelihood that some of the garden town sites within the district may also require um, or to be required to deliver or contribute towards suitable alternative natural green space. Um, in relation to the Epping Forest Special Area of Conservation, costs have not been attributed to those specific sites within the garden town IDP at this stage. Um, as you know uh, from previous discussions, the Epping Forest uh, Air Quality um, Recreational mitigation strategy is currently being finalised and alongside the strategic master, master planning it will help to determine the scale of the SANGs to be provided and their location and how they should be delivered and, and as we set out in the matter eight hearing statement uh, a SANG will be required for Latin Priory. I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Before I come on to the others around the table to um, I, I to perhaps express their concerns in relation to how the need has been assessed. Um, did, did you mention in your statement that, that you had a, um, a statement of common ground with Sport England? Um, we do indeed have a statement of common ground with Sport England. Um, I ha don't have it, the reference to hand okay. right now. I've got it somewhere. It's have okay. you? I can, I, we can find it for no, you. No, it's... I think it's ED, ED4. ED4, thank you. Yeah. Uh, are they, is that, a, that's a signed Yes, statement. that's a signed uh, statement and we've committed to doing some f further work on the back of that in, in line with the work that we've described to you around um, education and traffic and apportionment. We are doing some further work um, with Sport England and our colleagues in the leisure services here to, to do that piece of work now. Thank you. And, and does that statement um, broadly... Uh, explain that they're content with the evidence base and the standards adopted? They have signed off and were involved in the preparation of the three studies that I've uh, um, outlined in my um, statement. Um, and yes, they specifically signed them off. It was a, you know, one of the outcomes of the draft local plan consultation and their response to, to that in 2016 was the requirement to do those pieces of work and they were involved in developing both the briefs and sat on the project team and were part of signing off those documents. Okay, I, I understand that the Epping Society and Loughton Town Council and also Thaden Boys Parish Council had concerns about the assessment and whether or not it took account of proposed growth and the proximity 
um, of open space to communities. Having heard the council's explanation, is there anything else you, you wanted to say about that? Does, that? does that address your concerns? I think it's helpful, if I may say, if it's, it's helpful, yes, I think, I think that it does help. We just observe that access to the forest from Epping is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, in the wintertime, you have to negotiate mud to get there, or the very busy B1393. I don't think it affects policy or this plan, but uh, just an observation. Mr. Pond. Uh, Madam, would you object if I spoke more generally uh, than the particular question you just put to policy DM6? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the Town Council's objection to policy DM6, particularly in relation to the proposals to develop uh, open spaces within the Town of Loughton, uh, they are wholly and utterly inconsistent with the national policy planning framework, particularly in the new version, Paris 96 to 97. And uh, the policy reads entirely contrary uh, to proposals to develop Jessel Green, which, of course, you have apportioned to a later stage of these proceedings when our barrister will be speaking for us much more ably than I can. The points I would make is that uh, a, a concordat with Sport England is neither here nor there because these open spaces are not used merely for sport. They are used for all sorts of informal recreation. They are more than playing pitches. Uh, and there is little indication uh, in the um, studies quoted by uh, Ms. Blom Cooper of the nature and the quality of the amenity green space under uh, consideration. For instance, on Jessel Green, we know that the London County Council bought six acres additionally to provide open space, level open space playing fields in addition to the open hillside that they had designated as a public open space. If I may say so, Madam, um, your questions uh, are particularly important about designation of these areas, how are they to be designated? Is there a conflict between the two categories of open space? In, in our view, there is an, an entire uh, there's no contradistinction between them and uh, the way they have been allocated within the plan is inconsistent. And we wonder uh, whether, uh, Madam, that uh, the inclusion of urban open spaces was simply put in by the council as a pl ploy to convince you that they have looked at all the avenues open to development and expansion of housing other than Greenbelt take which we all deprecate. But in our view, uh, the paragraph uh, DM6 um, is uh, only honoured in the breach and not in the observance uh, in the proposals. Just in relation to Jessel Green, I'll, I'll ask why, why I, while I think of it. Um, obviously, we're going to discuss it in more detail later on. I'm sure it's in the evidence somewhere. But is there is there a, is there a master plan or anything that shows the, the area that's expected to be developed and anything up to date about how, how that's expected to be developed that I could have clearly in, in advance of that session? Um, well, obviously, the master plan area is shown uh, clearly in, in the plan. We haven't, because of uh, the controversy on this site allocation, we have not progressed with preparing a master plan for the site um, ahead of this examination, as we have with other sites, as you know, in, in the plan. Um, so uh, other than what is set out of the plan, we haven't got any further information, okay. although the policy does make specifically clear that we would not seek to develop more than 50% of the, the site okay. and that 50% 50, uh, 50 would be retained for um, as open space. Thank you. That's helpful. Be before we move on to the, the designations, so I said um, question 14 on my agenda is, is, still out, is still outstanding in relation to the local green spaces and district open land. I do want to ask some questions about that. Did anyone want to raise anything about the, about the standards or anything like that that's set out in the plan? Um, is there any concern, for example, that um, 
national standards for open space are not relevant or appropriate or anyone want to say anything more about questions 11 to 13, which I'm content with, before I move on to um, local green space. No. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Mr Lowry. I guess it's a tiny question in relation to your question um, 12 about financial contributions. Um, in the Council's IDP a mitigation table uh, near the end, I notice that um, in the order of a million or so is uh, planned to be distributed to two private sports organisations. Um, I wonder whether the Council could explain how those two were chosen above others and whether um, a development, an infrastructure development plan should be putting money uh, in the hands of private organisations or voluntary organisations uh, and the process of selection should be transparent. So I'll, I'll be, I don't, I don't I'm not sure what you've, what you've just asked. Well, <laughs> in here we've got... Um, what, which document are you referring to? The IDP, okay. The IDP. We've got um, unknown contributions to Epping Foresters Cricket Club, but it's not the only cricket club in town. And we've got uh, contributions to Upper Clapton Rugby Club for an artificial grass pitch, uh, 955,000 possibly. Again, how and why was that chosen? And should council or, or developers' money be put into uh, selected private or voluntary organisations? <coughs> Thank you. Do you want to comment, Ms. Marcus? I don't think I want to comment at this stage. I don't think it's relevant to this, this policy. I think if we can pick it up under the infrastructure matters later on. And the IDP schedule, as you know, is a living document and will be updated for time. I can only think that those projects came out of the studies that we've mentioned um, as potential projects, but no decisions have been made. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll move on for now to the, the question about local green space. So my question asked, paragraph 4.52 in the plan refers to local green spaces, but policy SP6, when the strategic policies, refers to district open land. We are going to discuss that a bit later on in the hearing sessions, but I asked, should the terminology be consistent? And should this policy, DM6, define the process by which local green space and district open land could be sought? And if not, should paragraph 4.52 be deleted? Now, the, the council, I think, says in its statements that district open land differs from local green space. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really still, I'm still not clear on, on this matter. And I think perhaps it requires further explanation because so paragraph 4.52 refers to the potential for the designation of local green space by communities. And I asked whether the terminology should be consistent with that used in policy SP6 concerning district open land. Now the council explained that the two designations are different, but paragraph 2.144, which supports SP6, indicates otherwise, I think, because it says in accordance with national planning policy, a local green space designation of district open land is proposed, which would suggest they're the same thing. Now, uh, as I said, policy SP6 is to be discussed later on under matter nine, but I wondered if the council could broadly explain, first of all, the difference as it sees it between the two designations. I, I think we saw the designation of district open land more akin to what, what in metropolitan areas would be called metropolitan open land. It's in order to avoid um, white land um, when we al proposed alterations to district, uh, to the Greenbelt boundaries, um, in, some, in a couple of locations we thought it was appropriate to give it um, a designation which is uh, wider than what I would see as a local green space uh, designation. So we proposed the designation of district open land. As you rightly indicate, I think we are going to deal with this more in matter nine, and, and maybe it's something we should come back to um, at that point if you're still concerned. Okay, 
Um, we, we can come back to it under batter nine, um, but perhaps the things to think about is I think, I think it does, the, wor the wording in paragraph 2.144 does, does suggest that it's the same thing. And I think the criteria in policy SP6 almost follows the criteria in, for local green space in the MPPF. And so if it's intended to be something different, then I think that, that requires explanation. Um, and then for the purpose of this policy, policy DM6, if we assume for, if we assume for now that district open land is, is something different, I'm assuming from this policy, DM6, that no local green space designations are proposed. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so if that's right, I suppose my question is, can, they, can local green space designations actually be sought as anticipated by paragraph 4.52? Because the MPPF, I think, explains that they can only be identified through local or neighbourhood plans uh, yeah I think we thought that, that it was appropriate for neighborhood plans to bring those designations forward okay I, I think I think I think there needs to be some clarity around around that because obviously you, you've got something in the supporting text which isn't which, which isn't then pursued by the plan and there's no mechanism presented in the policy itself for how that would happen and that that seems it's it's confused it seems confusing to me, so if it's intended that if they, if, if the process for that was to be in neighbourhood plans, and I think that should be explained, and then maybe we could come back to the question of how the district open land designation is expressed when we come on to, to matter nine. And if you just have a look at um, the criteria, because I, I, I'm not going to read them again now, but I think from my reading of it, it did seem to follow the NPPF um, designation of local green space and there's certainly a reference to local green space within the within the text and it's just if they're two separate things like that's potentially fine but they need, it needs to be clear uh, we're happy to amend the text in 4.52 to clarify the the mechanism thank you Did anyone else want to comment on that? Mr. Pond. Madam, if you are confused with all your knowledge and experience, what chance do the rest of us stand? I mean, this, I think, is a completely opaque set of policies. As I've said before, I think they're self-contradictory. And I wanted to, uh, to ask, uh, what on earth was white land, which was alluded to just now by Ms. Blom Cooper? And as an old draftsman, um, I took grave exception to paragraph 452 using the phrase, and not extensive in size. Well, that, that is one of the most sloppy definitions I've ever come across. Um, does it mean that one acre would be ac acceptable but not ten, or that ten acres would be uh, acceptable but not a hundred? Um, I think this whole section needs rewor reworking to make it consistent and to uh, obviate all the confusions which you pointed out. Well, thank you, but, but, ho but hopefully we'll, we'll get there through the, through the Council's um, acceptance of the need to clarify paragraph 4.52. As I said, it would be helpful to have a, an explanation discussion of the, um, the, the district open land designation when we come to it under, under matter nine. But I think in, in relation to the um, not extensive in size. I mean, the wording of the MPPF itself in paragraph 77 isn't particularly prescriptive. It talks about it shouldn't be an extensive tract of land. So I think there is perhaps some um, room for interpretation and, in, and, f and flexibility there. But, but you, you're, you're right that it's confusing, but, but hopefully um, it wasn't intended to be confusing and that it's something that can be resolved through the examination process. Okay, Any, anyone else on policy DM6? No, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to DM7, heritage assets.
Okay, so there, there are a number of um, amendments proposed to this policy, um, starting on page eight of the council's schedule handed out this morning. Um, so you can read question 15 that, that I asked there, and the council has proposed modifications towards those. But be before we discuss the... Have we still got Mr Spencer? Yes. Um, before we discuss the amendments proposed in direct response to my question 15, I think Miller Holmes, Mr Spencer, has raised objection to part B of the policy um, on the basis that it goes beyond the requirements of paragraphs 132 to 135 of the MPPF, and these set out a tiered approach to the consideration of harm connected to the value of the asset. And I think having read his statement, that seems to me a, a valid concern. Um, so perhaps if Mr Spencer could help us by explaining his concerns and then we'll see what the council's response to that is. Thank you, Ma'am. Um, as you've described, really, the um, NPPF sets out that three-tiered approach to considering harm. Um, and in summary, uh, it requires substantial public benefits to outweigh any substantial harm or the total loss of a designated heritage asset. Um, public benefits... Uh, need to be weighed against any less than substantial harm to a designated asset. And then finally, um, a balanced judgment should be made where there's any harm or loss of a non-designated heritage asset. Um, whereas my reading of Part B of Policy DM7 appears to apply more uh, onerous test um, to all assets, all her heritage assets, and um, requires public benefits of the proposal to considerably outweigh any harm. And this is regardless of whether the, whether the asset is designated or not, and regardless of the degree of harm caused. Um, so my client's position is that policy DM7 should be amended to be consistent with the, the three-tiered approach set out in the NPPF. Thank you. So if we could come to the council on that. First of all, I suppose the basic question is, is it intended that policy DM7 goes beyond the MPPF? And if it is, is that justified? The council considers that part B is consistent with the paragraphs 132 to 135 of the MPPF. And paragraph 4.58 in particular sets out the council's approach to assessing proposals which could affect the significance of a heritage asset. Um, and that this approach reflects national policy. Which In a paragraph, paragraph 4.58. Um, in, in accordance with uh, the proposed policy, any harm to a heritage asset is weighed depending on the significance of the asset. Um, and consistent with national policy, the Council's approach recognises that development may be acceptable if it can be demonstrated that substantial harm or loss of the asset is necessary to achieve a substantial public benefit to outweigh the harm or loss. Um, when, I mean, we're, we're clear that when such balancing exercise is undertaken for designated heritage assets, i.e. the Grade 2 listed buildings, parks and gardens, uh, the justification should be exceptional. And those of highest significance, i.e. scheduled monuments, Grade 1 and Grade 2 star listed buildings, and Grade 1, Grade 2 parks and gardens and World Heritage Sites, the justification should be wholly exceptional. Um, that approach, we feel, is articulated in Part B of Policy DM7 and the supporting text, where it's set out that there's a general presumption against allowing proposals which would cause harm to the asset unless there is clear and convincing justification to show that the public benefits of the proposal considerably outweigh the harm. Uh, we feel that the policy as drafted will provide suitable flexibility to allow it to be applied proportionately, taking into account relevant guidance and, where appropriate, in consultation with specialist advice such as Historic England. Uh, um, we are also proposing um, an amendment uh, to include within policy DM7 uh, protected lanes. Uh, which addresses the, the preservation of historic protected lanes, which is currently set out in the, the current adopted local plan policy HC4. Um, so we are proposing a further amendment, number 9A, uh, to include that protected lanes as a relevant asset. Uh, those, are, those protected lanes are already identified on our proposals map. They just weren't actually specified in policy.
Okay, well, I'll, I'll have to take it away and read those paragraphs, but just for my, un my understanding, the, it, it's not the council's intention to go beyond national policy. No. Smith. Uh, by way of clarification, I'm not clear whether national policy refers to local listings. Um, if we're not going beyond national policy, then surely in reference to local listings is wholly ineffective, and we would like to see local listed assets protected. N national policy does make reference to non-designated heritage assets. There thank, are provisions thank you. around that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Spencer. I'll, I'll consider the council's um, response against the MPPF and also look at the, the supporting text, so I'll do that outside of the hearing. Um, just to run through the proposed amendments in, in direct response to my question 15, um, if we take amendment seven first, the council is proposing an amendment to part A of the policy so that it would say conserve or enhance the character or appearance, and this is simply to ref accurate, re accurately reflect the statutory obligations. Does anyone have any comments around that? Nope, okay. <coughs> Proposed amendment Eight is a proposal to amend part B of the policy to include the requirements for heritage statements and archaeological evaluations referenced in the supporting text within the policy itself. So you can read that there on page eight of the amendment schedule. And that relates to both designated and non-designated assets. Does anyone have any concerns, comments? No? Okay. And proposed amendment nine, I'll take that one and then ask the council to explain 9A. So proposed amendment nine is a proposal to retitle the policy historic environment instead of heritage assets. Um, which is in response to a concern raised by Historic England. <coughs> Does anyone have any concerns about that? No. Is, it, is that particular amendment necessary for soundness? I think Historic England thinks it is, but... I think you're correct, Madam. That was Historic England's request, and, and we included it in our statement to common ground with them that we would change it. Okay. I don't think we feel strongly. Okay. But whether or not it ended up in the schedule of main modifications, you would change it under your additional modifications? Uh, given that we've agreed that with Historic England, yes. Okay. Okay, and then if I could just ask the council to explain proposed modification 9A, I think there's a typo in, in there because it refers to protected lanes as both designated and non-designated assets, unless I'm reading it wrongly. So uh, You're correct, madam, but we have both designated oh, okay. and non-designated protected lanes, and that's the reason for, for that. Um, and 
I think this amendment arose really as in response to Thane Boys Action Group and their comments about um, needing to include the existing policy HC4 and recognising that we do include protected lanes on our proposals map. It did seem to be consistent to then include it in, in the policy. Okay, so, so, it's a, so it's to ensure that protected lanes are given the protection by policy DM7, essentially. It's a, by, it's a definition point, really. Um, I agree with that in principle. I, I, don't think it's, I, I don't think it's particularly, perhaps not particularly nicely worded as protected lanes appear twice. I don't know if you could even just say, if there could be something in brackets even when it's finalised, just to say of which some are designated and some are not, or something like that, I don't know. Um, not a big point, but wasn't clear to me. It looked like a typo to me. But okay. But yes, any any concerns or comments, Thane and Boyce? Just to say, I welcome the amendment. Um, we Coopersar Lane in Thane and Boyce has um, various proposed developments around that um, over the years, uh, which have gone to appeal. And the planning inspector has always recognised the importance of um, protected lane, one stable. Um, Hyde's riding stable had to have the entrance to the stable in the Abridge Road and go, I don't know, several hundred metres to the rear of the stable rather than direct access onto the protected lane because, you know, movement of horse boxes and things. So, no, um, I welcome this amendment. Thank you very much, EFDC. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on to question 16, which concerned areas of townscape merit. Um, I think the, the council's statement suggested to me that policy DM7 offers sufficient protection to areas of townscape merit through part C, which concerns local heritage assets. Now, I guess in response to that, maybe a bit like the protected lanes issue, um, the text, the supporting text, seems to actually define these local heritage assets as built assets, really, on the local list. And paragraph 4.56 explains that non-designated assets include buildings and structures and archaeological remains, but it doesn't list, it doesn't refer to areas of townscape merit. So I suppose my question is, is it intended that planning proposals should have regard to areas of townscape merit? If not, why not? And if so, why couldn't we clarify this in the same way that it's proposed to refer to protected lanes? I think given the conversation we've just had, I think it would be sensible to include this as well. Um, the, the only thing we would say is that they haven't actually been designated um, and that's why we didn't originally in include them. Okay. So they're not on the proposals map. Mm -hmm. um, and we do think that the other policies in the plan will protect um, areas of landscape merit.
Okay, th thanks for that. That's helpful. Perhaps we could just explore, explore that point a little bit further. Um, is there a potential problem with referring to them if they're not actually designated? What, how, how does the, I don't, I suppose, how does the process by which they've been identified, or if you can explain where they are identified and how that process perhaps compares to the process for identifying assets on the local list or the protected lanes that we've just discussed? Because if it's fundamentally, I suppose, I might be concerned about adding it in if they don't have the if they don't have the appropriate status in the same way as the the other assets you've just referred to. I think we agree to you. I think the the heritage asset review did uh, suggest the establishment of them. We haven't actually formally established them and designated them. And why is that? Is there a reason why not? Is there an objection to it? I mean, so we don't want to be giving protection to things that a decision has been made not to protect them, for example. I don't, I don't think it's as, as specific as that. It's just a piece of work that hasn't been taken forward at this stage, and so we haven't got any designations at, at this point in time. And I think that's why we left it out. And that's not to say in the future that we couldn't consider that, but, but it's not part of our work program at the moment. Okay, so, so just going back to the original question then, I think you said in principle you're happy to add that in as something that should be protected in the same way as um, the, the lanes. Is, is, is there any potential problem with doing that if they haven't been designated or does that heritage asset review, could that be given the same status as a local list? Or what's, what's the, the, the rigour by which that evidence has been tested versus the local list, for example, that you are willing to protect? Uh, well, the local list has been through a process of council pr process of adoption, and, and those those haven't. Um, I think we could refer in the supporting text potentially to if they are designated in the future, uh, that that we would recognise them, but but deal with them in that way. Not treat the i.e. not treat them as the same as, as as something that has been formally designated by the council. If you were to, if if we if we were to address it in that way, um, by giving them appropriate reference as something that warrants protection in the supporting text, but that um, further work or a further process is necessary to um, actually give the appropriate weight to that policy, would you not also require a commitment in the plan to do that work? Otherwise, it could just be left hanging and wouldn't be effective. Yes, I think that, that is valid. I think I have to take that away and, and see whether there is commitment within the council to do that. Okay, so that's the council's position. If you could certainly do that, take it away as a point to consider, and then we'll, we'll hear the other issues around the table. Councillor Pond. Uh, Madam, I, I think the inclusion of areas of townscape merit was specifically recommended by the consultants. And as uh, on the uh, town council planning committee for five years and now on the district council planning committee for five years, we have had some success in protecting heritage assets, which are individual structures, uh, and but are, are of value to the local community and the heritage of which can be demonstrated to the satisfaction of an inspector at appeal. Uh, on the other hand, 
uh, where the attraction of an area is the townscape merit of it, it's much more difficult to do that. Uh, and I think that's why they should be in the process, in the, um, in the, in the list, and they should also be uh, equipped with a process for how they be identified and approved, as Alison Blom Cooper says. I would point out to you, Madam, that we've been talking about the local list. The local list was drawn up uh, just after the turn of the millennium, but there has been no process for revising it. And therefore, the provisions within the MPPF, uh, Paras 132 to 5, uh, talking about non-designated heritage assets, have been extremely important in Epping Forest. Uh, I think we need a commitment to revise and update the local list and to do it quickly, otherwise there will be no integrity to policy DM7. Um, there is a catch-all, as I've said, and we have made good use of it, but this is, I think, EFDC dragging its feet on these issues of identifying heritage areas and assets, and uh, we need a proposal uh, to safeguard areas, particularly those in Loughton and Epping, uh, where this designation would be most used. Thank you. If I could ask the, the council to, to comment on that, whether there's a, there's a, a sort of commitment to, to, to explain within the supporting text if there's any commitment or intention to update these, these lists and allow them to remain up to date to ensure the effectiveness of the policy. I, I'll have to come back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else on DM7? Mr. Pond, is your board still up from last time? Did you want to make another point? No? Uh, no, I, okay. I left my board up, uh, Madam, but um, okay. yes, uh, I, I think I would just like to say that I would find the plan inconsistent with MPPF and incomplete unless that was done. And therefore, I would ask you, on behalf of the urban communities within Epping Forest, uh, to consider that point in your report. Now, we don't have policy DM8, Heritage at Risk, on the agenda because I didn't have any questions about it. Um, does anyone else? I, I know the Epping Society, I think, raised some concern in its statement. But I, I wasn't perhaps particularly uh, Madam, the clear first part of it was really the point which uh, Councillor Pond has just made about keeping that, that list up to date. Right. Um, I don't think there's anything more we want to say. Okay. In that case, does anyone else have anything to say on policy DM8, Heritage at Risk? Mr. Pond. Madam, the, the policy is okay so far as it goes, but I do wonder uh, if it will expect property owners to work proactively to the authority, with the authority. What happens if they don't? Uh, this is a kind of watchdog with no teeth, and uh, I, I think there should perhaps be some reference to enforcement action uh, as well as uh, the uh, commitment to partnership working. Does the council have any comments? I don't think that's necessary to make it a sound policy. Why is that? Because the policy provides the framework for the council to take any enforcement action uh, should it consider it expedient to do so. Okay, thank you. That, that leaves us with policies DM9 and DM10 to discuss. Um, it's, it's 10 past one now. I'll take views on what people would, would like to do. I and mean, we do have a few questions on that, but I, I'm, I'm happy to press on and finish if people would like to. Or we can take a, a break for lunch or a shorter break for lunch. Shorter break has been suggested over there. Is that, that, 
Good with everybody? Okay. How, how long? Is everybody here? Is everybody here for DM? There's no reason to think that there's people are missing for DM 9 and 10. Everybody's here. Okay. Um, if we came back at quarter to two, would that suit everybody? Yep. Okay, we'll come back at quarter to two.